Okay, I'd like to call the Prince William County School Board to order. Um, the purpose of the meeting, the meeting of the Prince William County School Board is being conducted electronically under the Virginia Code 2237082 of, in the authority granted by the General Assembly on April 22, 2020 through Amendment 28 to House Bill 29, which permits the school board to meet electronically during the pendency of the current state of emergency for the purpose of transacting such business as is statutorily required or necessary to continued operations of the Prince William County Public Schools and the discharge of its lawful purposes, duties, and responsibilities. A motion is in order. Ms. Sargaport. Mr. Chairman, I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the closed session agenda as recommended. Second. Second. Ms. Wall seconds. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, please vote. Uh, Ms. Ralston, how do you vote? Uh, uh, yes. Ms. Ralston votes yes. Okay. Ms. Jesse, how do you vote? The vote is seven yes, one not present vote. Williams, motion passed. Okay, moving on to the motion to enter closed session. A motion is in order. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> I move that, whoops, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I move that the Prince William, we're on, second, on number two, right? Yeah, I, one, I'm one, sorry. Yeah. I mean, um, <laughs> I'm discuss. so sorry. It's one of those days. A motion is in order to approve the closed session agenda. Um, um, I move that the Prince William, no, I'm so sorry. We're on two, right? Yeah. Okay, I'm so sorry. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that we move into closed session. Motion is order. Um, Rerect number one, to discuss the staff performance, appointment, transfer, release, assignment, and promotion of specific officers, employees, or appointees under Virginia Code sections 2.2-3711A1, and to dispense with the attendance of the superintendent as needed under Virginia Code section 2.2, 22.1-69, Two, to discuss the legal, with legal counsel and take action on the placement and disciplinary appeals of specific students under the Virginia Code sections 2.2-3711A, 2, and 8. Three, to receive information and discuss with division counsel and staff actual and probable litigation and legal matters involving specific employees and students under Virginia Code sections 2.2-3711A, 7, and 8. And four, to discuss the investment of public funds for the acquisition of goods and services relating to the security of PWCS automated data processing systems, information technology systems, and software programs subject to the exclusions provided in Virginia, sec Virginia Code sections 2.2-2705.2, numbers 2 and 14, where discussion in open session would jeopardize the security of such systems and programs and where competition or bargaining is involved and, if made public initially, the financial interests of the school board would be adversely affected under Virginia Code sections 2.2-27116 and 19. And five, to receive advice and information from legal counsel and staff regarding the acquisition of real property for school sites where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the school board, and to discuss the investment of public funds where competition or bargaining is involved, where if made public initially, <clears throat> The financial interests of the school board would, adversely, would be adversely affected under Virginia Code sections 2.2-3711A, 3, 6, 7, and 8. Do I have a second? Second. Ms. Wall seconds. Any discussion? Please vote. Uh, Ms. Ralston, how do you vote? Yes. Ms. Jesse, how do you vote? Okay, you got it. Okay, the vote is seven yes, one not present vote. Williams, motion passed. Okay, at this point, the Prince William County <clears throat> School Board will now enter closed session and return open session in approximately one hour. Prince William County School Board is now returning to open session from closed session. Um, a motion, uh, we're moving on to closed session certification. A motion is in order. Whoops. <laughs> Ms. Williams. Yes. 
All right, closed session certification. I move that pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3712, the closed session of the Prince William County School Board meeting of March 3rd, 2020, be certified by adopting the following resolution. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Prince William County School Board hereby certifies that, to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements were discussed in the closed meeting to which the certification resolution applies, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed session meeting were heard and or discussed or considered by the school board. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Wall. Seconds? Um, any discussion? <laughs> and we vote. Ms. Ralston, how do you vote? Yes. Ms. Ralston, Ms. Ralston votes yes. The vote is seven yes, one not present at vote. Dr. Latif, motion passed. Moving on to closed, section, closed session action items, a motion is in order. Madam Chair? Uh, oh. That's what I'm going to read. Okay. <laughs> I, move that per, per, <laughs> I move that pursuant to Virginia Code 2.3712B, the school board met in closed session at an undisclosed location for the purpose of interviewing candidates for the position of division superintendent. And accordingly, the school board hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only that personnel matter which is exempted from open meeting requirements under Virginia Code 2.2-3711A1 was discussed in the closed meeting to which the certification resolution applies and for which public notice was given during the school board meeting of February 4th, 2021. I have a second. I second. Ms. Wall seconds. Ms. Ralston, how do you vote? Yes. Ms. Ralston votes yes. The vote is seven yes, one not present at vote. Dr. Latif, motion passed. All right, so we are on. Oh, okay. Um, so moving on to closed section, closed session action items, a motion is in order. Madam Vice Chair Woon, excuse me, last time. I'm, I'm sorry? Yeah. Oh, you gonna, yeah. Oh, I am so sorry, <laughs> Ms. Williams. <laughs> I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the appointments and releases of specific employees as a presented in closed session. I second. Thank you, Ms. Wall seconds. Ms. Ralston, how do you vote? Yes. Ms. Ralston votes yes. So we are now on. So the vote is seven yes, one not present at vote. Dr. Latif, motion passed. 9.02. Mm, Madam Chair, Vice Chair. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So, Ms. Williams, the motion is in order. Thank you. Uh, I move that the Prince William County School Board authorize the chairman at large to execute and provide the superintendent and the associate superintendent for human resources the board's March 3rd, 2020 letter requesting immediate identification of key administrative personnel vacancies to be filled on an interim or permanent basis as needed, as discussed in closed session. Key administrative personnel, as described in the school board's February 15th, 2021 motion, do not include school-based personnel with the exception of principals. Do I have a second? I second. Ms. Wall seconds. Um, Ms. Ralston, how do you vote? Yes. Ms. Ralston votes yes. We are on 9.03. Vote is seven yes, one not present at vote. Dr. Latif, motion passed. All right, awesome. Now you're on 9. Madam All right. Vice Chairwoman. Uh, Ms. Williams. I move that the Prince William County School Board remand the appeal of student SR21-043 to the Office of Student Management and Alternative Programs to offer the student an opportunity to remain enrolled as a virtual student at Garfield Senior High School under an agreement by whereby 
the student must remain off school property and may not return to in-person learning until a further review by OSMAP of the outcome of the proceedings against the student in the juvenile, domestic, juvenile and Domestic Relations Court. Do we have a second? I second. Ms. Wall seconds. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, let's vote. Ms. Ralston, how do you vote? Yes. Ms. Vals Ms. Ralston votes yes. And the vote is seven yes, one not present at vote. Dr. Latif, motion passed. <clears throat> I would like to call the meeting of the Prince William County School Board to order. Uh, this is the purpose of the meeting. The meeting of the Prince William County School Board is being conducted electronically under Virginia Code Section 2.2-3708.2 and the authority granted by the General Assembly on April 22nd, 2020 through the Amendment 28 to, the House Bill, to House Bill 29, which permits the school board to meet electronically during the pendency of the current state of emergency for the purpose of transacting such business as is statutorily required or necessary to continue operations of the Prince William County Public Schools and the discharge of its lawful purposes, duties, and responsibilities. All right. We, uh, yeah, we have the pledge. Do we have any students here tonight who would like to lead the pledge? Are there any? <laughs> All right. Please rise, facing the flag. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, individual, with liberty and justice for all. Oh, I'm sorry. Would you, where, would you please tell us your name and where you are from? I'm sorry. Thank you. My name is Jawan Hill, and I'm a 17-year-old senior at Charles J. Cogan High School. All right. Thank you. Thank you for doing the pledge for us this evening. Um, moving on, we have approval of the public meeting agenda. Um, and a motion is in order. Ms. Williams. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the public meeting agenda as recommended. Do I have a second? A second. Turn your mic on. Happen. Any discussion? No. Can we vote? Yeah. Uh, Ms. Ralston, how do you vote? Yes. Ms. Ms. Ralston votes yes. And the vote is seven yes, one not present vote. Dr. Latif, motion passed. We are at 12 point, 13, sorry. 13, adoption of the consent agenda. A motion is in order, Ms. Williams. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the public meeting consent agenda as recommended. Do we have a second? Yes. 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 Ms. Ralston. Yes. <laughs> Ms. Ralston seconds. Uh, any discussion? Seeing no discussion, uh, let's vote. Ms. Ralston, how do you vote? Um, yes. And the vote is seven yes, one not present vote. Dr. Latif, motion passed. And we move on to citizen comments. Um, Due to the COVID-19 state of emergency and legal restrictions on the school board's authority to conduct it, its meetings through electronic means, unlike other public bodies meeting electronically under more expansive legal authority, all discussion at this meeting by board members, staff, and citizens must be limited to agenda items. Citizens may speak on an agenda item for two minutes when the board is able to resume regular meetings without the virtual participation permitted during the state of emergency. Expanded citizen comment will be resumed as provided by policy 134. In the interim, citizen comment time has been reinstated on a limited basis in order to allow public comment both in person and through electronic means during the state of emergency. Citizens are encouraged to submit their comments by email to the clerk who will share them with the school board. Those citizens who have signed up in advance with the school board clerk via email no later than 4 p.m. Wednesday, March 3, 2021, may address the school board in person or virtually electronically about matters relating to March 3, 2021 agenda items only. There is one speaker signed up to speak in person and four have signed up to speak virtually. When you speak, please use proper decorum and manners while at the podium and or speaking virtually. If you do not you do so, you will be asked to step aside. Please state your name and address for the record. So let's start with our in-person. I have... 
is it Amali? Amali Ikes. Amali Ikes, yes. Oh, <laughs> terrific. Um, good evening, Madam Vice Chair Zagapur, members of the board, Dr. Waltz. My name is Amali Ikes, and my husband and I are both high school teachers in the county. We also have two elementary aged children who attend in person learning in PWCS. I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight about the impact caused by the last minute notification to cancel many before and after school aged child care programs across our county. Many families have been left to figure it out on their own. Here is how we have been impacted as well as possible solutions for you to consider. On Wednesday, February 17th, the decision passed to phase in all remaining grade levels into the hybrid model with an earlier start time for high school, which our family was prepared for. But then on Friday, February 19th, families in and around our county received emails from Alpha Best around 6.15 p.m. informing them that due to low interest, the decision was made to cancel SAC at most elementary locations where it was being offered until interest reached the minimum of 30 students. This notification came three days before teachers were to report to their buildings to begin hybrid instruction. On Saturday, February 20th, Mr. Wilk responded to my plea for help and I greatly appreciate his willingness to assist in seeking out available options. On Monday, February 22nd, Mr. Wilk and I were in communication the entire day to see what options were available for SAC, but no alternative solutions to the sudden cancellation were available. This left me and other families scrambling. On Thursday, February 25th, the day the freshmen returned to our school, our only option was to hire a Prince William County High School student who was attending virtually to watch our children. She is now balancing her own classes to babysit our children until it's time to walk them to their bus stop. I do not believe that this is a sustainable solution. If SAC cannot be established at all the elementary schools where there is even one family indicating the need for care, then please consider these other options. Please provide bus transportation for any student attending one of the 21 schools where Alpha Best is offering full-time daycare with virtual learning for students to their base school. If transportation from the full-day Alpha Best locations cannot be provided, then please consider combining neighboring elementary schools and establish one of them as the SAC location with transportation to their base school. Thank you. We have uh, three virtual speakers this evening. Yes, we actually have four virtual oh, four. speakers. The first one is Derek Barcelona. You can unmute yourself. And Hello, my name is Derek Barcelona. I'm a new resident of the Prince William County School District living in Gainesville, Virginia. The three steps to opening our schools should be vaccinate, educate, and don't indoctrinate. I am a new resident of the Prince William County School System. I've read over your agenda item. What is very concerning to me is a student being placed on suspension for disciplinary action for 10 days. 10 days without instruction will be very detrimental to the student instructionally wise when they get back to the classroom. This is exclusion in society, not inclusion. I would rather have the school board discipline the student with in-school suspension, letting the student work on classwork while in suspension if, it is, if this is the first offense. I feel that this rule of 10-day suspension could especially hurt children with disabilities as a special education student needs full-time attention and engage in the classroom. Therefore, the 10-day, two-week suspension should be appraised, reviewed as a final decision when all else fails, must be starting tonight at this school board meeting. Thank you for your time. And remember, vaccinate, educate, don't indoctrinate. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is Maggie Hansford. You can unmute yourself and you have the floor. Hi, thank you everyone. My name is Maggie Hansford and my address is on file with the clerk. I wanna first start off with thanking all of our staff. They've moved mountains, um, not only this whole school year, but specifically these past couple of weeks. And I think we can all agree on um, how strong our staff has been for our students and our community. Um, I would like to acknowledge the hybrid model and how difficult this is um, for all 
for everyone involved. And I think that we need to start building a plan for next year with regards to this. And I hope that the division and the school board acknowledge how important it is to have staff included in that decision-making process. I wanna thank the chair and vice chair for working with me during the budget season. Um, I continue to advocate for hazard pay or um, in the form of a bonus for our employees for all that they've done this school year. I wanna thank Lori Williams for advocating on behalf of the school division at last night's Board of County Supervisors meeting. And I continue to ask the board and division to work with me in addressing staff concerns to ensure a safe and successful school year. I appreciate everyone's time tonight, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker uh, is Nathan Hale. You can unmute yourself. Yeah. Hello, school board. My name is Nathan Hiley. I'm a ninth grader at Patriot High School. I believe that ninth graders should not have to do standardized testing this year. I can speak for my class when I say we are tired, stressed, depressed, and anxious. Class of 24 has lost nearly everything we cared about even before the pandemic. We're struggling mentally. And that struggle has been multiplied by the lack of social interaction we have. We as a class cannot handle the unbearable pressure of SOL and standardized testing this year. We are not ready. If the SOL happens, this will destroy the little bit of enthusiasm we have left for school. Most of us don't even remember what we learned in class after two weeks because we can only learn so much over a screen. How are we supposed to remember things from the beginning of the school year? This is not a standard school year and you guys know it. At this point, you guys need to decide what is more important, students' physical and mental well-being or standardized tests because both of these cannot coexist. I don't know what you guys can do for us, but you guys need to do something to cancel these standardized testing and fast. Class of 2024 is sinking and you guys need to help us before we drown. Thank you. Thank you. Our last um, speaker is Sandra Kern. You can unmute yourself. Up, oh, actually. Ms. Kern, I'm having an issue with your version of Zoom. It's out of date. It's not going to allow me to allow you to speak tonight. I'm, you must be using a different device. Um, she's going to have to use a different device and come back later, perhaps. Um, Vice Chair, I don't know how you want to go forward with this. Ah, what would be, I'm getting a shaking her head. Yeah. Um, are, does the, is the board oh, um, in agreement that we can maybe hear from her as soon as her Zoom is back? At the end of the meeting, perhaps? I'd love to hear from my constituents. Hold on, hold on one second. Oh, wait, Actually, wait, wait. it looks like she's, she's coming on another device. Let me just see here. It's been one of those days. Okay, you have the floor. Can you hear me? Ah. You can hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Fantastic. First off, my name is Sandra Kern. I live in the Potomac District. My address is on file. And Madam Chair, Vice Chair, I so appreciate you being the stand-up woman for um, women leadership uh, in this meeting and all of the wonderful ladies that are serving to um, help our children. Technology is a little difficult, so we'll just have to move on from there. I want to stop and say that this new page that we've turned is a word revolutionizing, as Mr. Wilk had shared at the last long board meeting. Hopefully we won't have to have too many more of those, but I would like to see that the community steps forward to support our schools during the budget season and make sure that we have our voice heard over at the Board of Supervisors. And yes, Ms. Williams, I appreciate you speaking for us last night. Also, the program or presentation tonight on the equity lens, a perfect opportunity to be listeners. And I believe that the budget will also help with that position in our future. I can say last week, my fifth grade grandson, I thought was going to be typing with his toes, but now he's in person thriving. And I've seen so many other students um, posting that they are 
thrilled with their opportunities. And I appreciate from the bottom of my heart the board members that were at the welcoming of the open classes. Again, I know you have our children's heart. Um, you are eyes and ears like our wonderful teachers. And I hope that their COLA um, increase comes through as well. Thank you so much. Enjoy your evening and be blessed. All right, thank you. Moving on to our student representative, Ms. Caroline Silvera is our student representative from Hilton High School, and she will be joining us virtually this evening. Is Caroline ready to go? Yeah, she thank you so much. Um, so first I'd like to say thank you to all the students for coming out today. I really do love when students come and speak at the board meetings, regardless of what they're speaking on, because um, it shows increased student involvement. So that really does make me happy. And that was a nice surprise. Um, but like I was saying, hi, everybody. I can't believe that it's March already. It feels like it was just August. Uh, some PWCS students returned to the building this week. And I have to say, I was so impressed and proud to see the amount of effort that was put back into this return. Schools had amazing signs for their students and some student leaders such as those from Colgan High School and Osborne Park High School had programs in place in order to raise the spirits of those coming back. The Osborne Park Student Council even offered a senior buddies program where seniors could show freshmen around the building. I would like to thank everyone who went into planning in planning return to in-person learning for students as it really was an outstanding effort. I recently had the pleasure of attending both the Black Student Union Coalition and Cultural Clubs Coalition meetings. The Black Student Union Coalition is comprised of students from Hilton and Battlefield High Schools, although they are always open to new members, and they had a great discussion about being Black in PWCS with school board member Mrs. Jesse. The Diversity and Inclusion Committee of the Student Senate hosted our second Cultural Clubs Coalition meeting a few weeks ago as well. We discussed the county's new social and racial justice coalition with our guests, Mrs. Jesse and Ms. Williams. I would like to thank you guys again for coming and connecting with our student leaders. We honestly had a really great conversation. I'm so glad that both of these organizations allow students to have an outlet where they can express themselves and collaborate with other student leaders. Finally, I would like to address a concern that many students have brought to me. I sent a letter to the school board regarding AP exams, so I know that they are already aware of the issue, but I would like to address it publicly. Currently, the AP exam schedule three chosen for PWCS students directly conflicts with graduation, with some exams falling on or after graduation. In addition, the tests during that period are high level STEM classes, such as AP Calculus and Physics C, which are usually senior majority classes. Additionally, there are not in-person options for most exams this year. My current recommendation is that we offer in-person options for those scheduled three AP examinations if not all AP examinations, which would still be under testing schedules two and three. This would address the issue of seniors since in-person versions of conflicting exams are available earlier and any internet connectivity issues AP students may have. Some exams are as long as three hours, so if students do not have a stable internet connection, they could miss out on receiving college credit. We offered in-person SAT exams this fall, so this is certainly doable. The full version of my letter is on my Twitter at Caroline PWCS if anybody in the public is interested. Um, and please feel free to reach out to me at silvercf21 Silver CF at pwcs-edu.org with any questions, comments, or concerns. Thank you all so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Silvera. Uh, we are moving on to superintendent's time. Dr. Waltz. Thank you very much, Vice Chairwoman Zagapur, members of the board, good evening. If you read last week's edition of The Scoop, you would have noticed even during a pandemic that schools across the division recognized Black History Month with a variety of learning activities. This video from Carydale Elementary School on What You're Reading Wednesdays is one of my favorites. Please roll the video. What's up, Cardinals? Welcome to What You Reading Wednesday. My name is Tasha Johnson. I'm the new reading specialist at Carrie Dell. This is my first year being a reading specialist. I wanted to provide a way to connect with the kids and then to get them reading and, and engaged in reading. So I did the What You Reading Wednesday. Thank you for joining me today with a Black History Moment with Miss Johnson. Today I'm going to read May Among the Stars, and it is about a astronaut called Dr. Mae Jameson. Every Wednesday, I do a, a different diverse books just to get them involved in reading. 
I felt that it was important to focus on those unsung heroes of Black history, um, those Black history figures. So we did the Gordon Parks, we've done Mae Jameson, we've done Chick Webb, and then we have done Lawrence Joyner. So I did interactive read-alouds, four interactive read-alouds, and then at the end of that read-aloud, I want the kids to show me what they know. And so they provide a flip grid and have three interesting facts or just how the um, historical figure has inspired them. She inspired me to do anything I want if I can believe it, if I work hard for it. And someday I want to be as great as her. Students are posting pictures, they're posting videos, they are, um, when I'm going into the classroom, they're like, Miss Johnson, this is what you're reading Wednesday. And so they put up their book of, you know, what they're reading. Drop your pictures, drop your videos. I want to know what you're reading Wednesday. Take care, Cardinals. <laughs> Very cute. And, you know, during a pandemic, it's critical to be kind to one another. And I brought that up at several meetings. Patriot High School recently celebrated Kindness Matters Week with their Smiles for Miles campaign. Learn more in this video. Please roll the video. recognize some of those characters there at the end. Uh, that was really great. As we move into the first few days of this month, I would like to acknowledge that March is the Virginia School Board's Association Equity and Education Month. The promise of public education is for every child to be successful in school and in life, especially during a pandemic. As we continue our important work to look at everything we do through an equity lens. And as we work through the fiscal 22 budget process, I encourage everyone to be aware of the importance of equity in resources, including educational settings, supplies, technology, staffing, and buildings. I also look forward to seeing how our schools will be acknowledging equity and education months in the next few weeks. Since our last meeting, I had the opportunity to visit Dumfries Elementary School, Woodbridge Middle School, Gainesville Middle School, and Hilton High School. Dumfries Elementary was welcoming back in-person fourth and fifth grade students, and I observed a physical education class learning how to juggle and talk to the teachers and staff. I also read aloud the book, Exclamation Mark, by Amy Rouse Rosenthal, which we videotape to share with our schools in case they want to share it with their students across the school division. When visiting Woodbridge Middle School, I checked in on the school food and nutrition services staff who are mourning the loss of their friend and colleague, Flor Cervantes. Also at Gainesville Middle School, I discovered a teacher there who has been following me for years on all the code red calls. He's the go-to person over there at Gainesville Middle School for the most predicted dates of certain code red calls. It was really interesting. I received an email from Marcy Abel, who teaches, substitute, or teaches students with special needs at Vaughn Elementary School. I wanted to show her signature line, which reminds us to wear a mask. And you can see that at the, that's the end of every email uh, that appears. I appreciate Ms. Abel's assistance in reminding everyone about our important mitigation procedures during the pandemic. I also want to congratulate her and wish her well 
as she is retiring this year. I also want to provide a thank you to our staff for working so hard to ensure a smooth return to in-person learning for all grade levels for those students who have chosen to do so. It has been an incredible collaborative effort of teachers, administrators, and support staff. Due to the many staff that received their second COVID-19 vaccines last week, and many who will do, do so this week as well, our schools had the extra challenge of increased teacher and administrator absences, as well as support staff caused by staff impacted by side effects. I would like to thank all those who substituted for our teachers and administrators and support staff workers, including over 100 central office staff who volunteered to pitch in and serve in schools during this time. Before closing, I also want to mention that March is much more than the one year anniversary of the worldwide pandemic. It is also Middle Level Education Month, Music in Our Schools Month, National Nutrition Month, Social Work Month, and Youth Art Month. This month, our schools will also be recognizing Women's History Month. I want to express my appreciation to our middle school staff members, all of our food service employees, many of which have been working since last March, providing free food for our community, and the important role of our social workers in the well being of our students. I would also like to honor our music and art teachers who have been working very hard to teach in dif difficult and different unique ways during this pandemic. I appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Waltz. Uh, we are moving on to item number 17, board matters. 17.01 is uh, superintendent's update on the pandemic. Yes, and thank you again and good evening. Following my brief remarks, I will turn it over to Ms. Jarcelyn Hart, who will facilitate a panel of principals who will provide an update on the return of students to the in-person learning option. This panel is at the request of school board members who asked to hear directly from principals. Please note that at our next regular school board meeting, we will have an additional principal panel focused on providing an academic progress update. This provides time for principals to focus on the in-person return that is going on now. Following Ms. Hart, Denise Hebner, Associate Superintendent for Special Education and Student Services, who along with her team will provide further details on the latest health information. The numbers of COVID-19 cases in PWCS are dynamic. And as of Monday, March 1, from February 21st to February 27th, we had 51 confirmed cases of students and staff, equal to the previous week of February 14th through 20th. For the month of February, we had 299 cases compared to 899 in January. PWCS continues to work as rapidly as possible to vaccinate all staff who want the vaccine with their second dose, primarily through our outstanding partners at Novant UVA Health Additionally, Inova Health has been supporting vaccinating our employees as well. This past Monday completed the use of Unity Reed High School for vaccinations as we return more students to in-person learning. I want to give a tremendous thank you uh, to Principal uh, Nichols and the amazing staff of Unity Reed for hosting this important work for the past few weeks. We are working with Novant UVA Health, the county and the Prince William Health District to move the vaccination clinic to the Kelly Leadership Center, also known as the KLC. The exact timeline for the use of the KLC is still being finalized, but is likely to be a host site until this summer. In order to accommodate the use of the KLC, we will phase back staff to the KLC on a limited basis with an emphasis on use of the building only for the staff that provide in-person services. Please know that our employees are working extremely hard to serve our students to our fullest ability as we work to implement the school board plan for return to in-person learning with all the appropriate mitigations to make it as safe as possible. As a reminder, if staff see something of concern when returning to their building, we encourage them to speak with their administrator. 
If they don't feel that they can do that, you can email health and safety at pwcs.edu or call the anonymous tip line at any time at 703-791-2821. We take all concerns seriously and will follow up to ensure the safety of all. I would now like to turn things over to Mrs. Hart. Thank you, Dr. Waltz. I'm going to go ahead and do a brief introduction, if I if I may, please, before we get to uh, to, to Ms. Hart um, introducing everyone. So, uh, sure. so thank you. So, thank you, Dr. Waltz. Good evening, Madam Chair and School Board. Tonight, we will be hearing from three outstanding principals to share out on their experiences with their efforts to support our most recent phase of in-person learning. We will start off by hearing from Dr. Richard Nichols, principal of Unity Reed High School, followed by Giovanni Mitchell, principal of Hampton Middle School, and finally, Dr. Dari Grover, principal of Featherstone Elementary. So right now we're gonna turn it over to Dr. Richard Nichols. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Dr. Latif, Dr. Waltz, and school board, um, and all the members uh, present this evening. I would like to uh, thank you for the opportunity this evening to speak about our update on the pandemic in our return to in-person learning um, as of last Thursday. And uh, I would like to specifically thank uh, Denise Hubner uh, and her staff for all the um, support that she provided uh, during the um, vaccination clinics at Unity Read. Um, it was a pleasure to host that event and uh, we're grateful that uh, for all the flexibility uh, that she provided. Uh, so it was a pleasure to, week to work with them. Um, and I'm looking forward to um, Glad that we were able to support the effort. Uh, so Unity Read is, is in its first year, um, and I say that due to the name change. Uh, so we're excited at Unity Read, uh, but we're also during this pandemic, we've had a challenging journey uh, to get to this point. Um, I'd like to commend all of the work of my staff and community uh, for all of their hard work throughout this school year uh, to support our students in a virtual in person and now a hybrid learning environment. Uh, so we started this school year, this journey with 30 in-person learners, as well as providing in-person ongoing support for testing. So we have had students coming into the building throughout the school year uh, for testing, as well as starting in December uh, with athletics. Um, we welcome back ninth graders last Thursday, February 26th and 27th in house A and B. Um, approximately 90 students attended each day. Um, so we have 2,600 students at Unity Read uh, for our incoming uh, ninth grade class. Um, we had 180 students who were freshmen who chose to do in-person learning. Um, actually, we had more. We had 100, 300, 180 of them attended uh, either on Thursday or Friday. Um, that evening, we had a virtual PTSO meeting uh, attended well by families uh, offered in English and Spanish, uh, and we provided support to those students and families with an update on how things were going and what to expect and what we witnessed the first day, uh, very well attended, as well as a lot of great information, great questions uh, from our families. Uh, and that has been ongoing throughout the pandemic. Um, also reached out to uh, student leaders with focus groups throughout the pandemic. Uh, ben Kim, our student representative on the school board, I met with and provided him updates uh, as to what to expect when students did return to in-person learning. So on Tuesday, uh, yesterday, we welcomed back all grades, nine through 12. So this week we had approximately 250 students per day. So in house A and B. So we had 500 learners on two days um, of 2,660 students. So about 18% uh, of our learners uh, chose to participate in in-person learning. Um, presently, we have 780 students who have opted for in-person student selection, um, and we have eight, 1,880 who have opted for virtual, and we do uh, recognize um, that fourth quarter is open until March 12th for students to switch to in-person. Um, but right now we have um, approximately 69%, 70% of our students are uh, virtual learners and 30% are in-person learners. Um, so we've been working diligently throughout the school year since 
really a year ago, uh, designing mitigation and PPE strategies to maintain social distancing. Um, now that we're back with more students, um, the procedures we've had in place um, are seem deemed effective, seem to be effective uh, for social distancing. Uh, in all of our classrooms have more than six feet uh, social distancing, uh, mask, uh, as well as the hand sanitizers throughout the building. Um, so students that are at Unity Read have been provided breakfast and lunch daily uh, uh, at no charge. Um, uh, we have individual desks in the cafeteria. Uh, and right now we're able to maintain that approximately 50 students uh, per cafeteria. We have two, one on the first and one on the second floor. Um, so we have four lunch shifts. Um, so we are able to maintain that 50 student cap. Uh, and we have um, had successful uh, uh, feeding of students both in the morning and during lunch. Um, all of our teachers returned um, and are providing concurrent instruction. Um, they have experienced a small number of in-person students, approximately 34 per classroom, uh, but our technology uh, T-SPEC as well as our instructional technology coach um, and the administration uh, worked fairly diligently to make sure that we had the six feet uh, uh, social distancing in the classrooms, set up the cameras, the headset. So we appreciate all the support from uh, technology office to get those uh, technology learning devices in place. Um, and we are in the process of, you know, really trying out the concurrent learning model, uh, which we know is likely, um, you know, here to stay. And well, it's, it's a good, it's a good way to get into it uh, for this year so that when we transition to next year, uh, teachers will be comfortable with the model. Um, so as far as staffing, um, when we returned, um, we were able to, uh, our tier one teachers, many of them returned uh, due to the vaccine last week uh, because they had had both of the vaccinations. Uh, next week on March 9th, many will return as well. Uh, but due to the vaccination of staff and teacher absences, uh, our staffing has been relatively smooth. Um, we have not really had any uh, need uh, to have any, um, we've had substitutes uh, provide uh, instruction in the library uh, for those teachers uh, that are not in the building and provide um, instruction while they are still continuing uh, to either work from home or asynchronous instruction. Uh, due to getting the vaccine uh, in, the next, in the last couple of weeks. Um, I mentioned technology. Um, there's been a lot of work by our T-SPEC. I want to thank him. Uh, the one-to-one -one initiative, I want to say one thing that has been very uh, noticeable is that 95% of students, I think we had 13 students today that did not bring their device out of 250 students. So students are bringing their devices to school. Um, I can't say they're always fully charged, but we do have power strips and things to charge them. Uh, but uh, one of the things we worried about at Unity Read and I think in the high school was, will kids bring their device to school? Um, and they are bringing them to school. So that has been very uh, uh, helpful because um, I know down the road, that's something that we're looking to. We, every student has been afforded the opportunity to get a device. Um, and if they do not get have a device, then we have been able to provide them one. Um, we have 13 students, as I said today, and they all get a device to utilize during the school day. Um, so if you add staff and students, we have approximately 500 students and staff in the building on any given day uh, from Tuesday to Friday. Uh, in a normal school year, that number would be closer to um, 3,000 people. Um, so it's you're looking at about... Uh, 20% of our, of our uh, normal capacity as far as uh, visitors and parents and students, et cetera, uh, which assists with the mitigation and PPE strategies. Um, so we've had a gradual transition to support in-person learning safely and handle the logistics of arrival, breakfast, lunch, restroom, student transitions, um, and dismissal. Um, so we continue to provide extracurricular athletics, uh, opportunities, testing, uh, which is a big uh, component of that. Um, additional remediation support for in-person and virtual students Monday to Friday. Uh, we have started a credit recovery program for students, uh, seniors specifically, and tutoring to support uh, struggling learners, both in-person and virtually. And I know we had many students that arrived on Monday 
um, who are seniors that need it, uh, credits for graduation. Uh, so at Unity Read, we're looking forward to a positive end to the 2020-21 school year, supporting our students in a hybrid format. And I would just like to thank uh, Unity Read, would like to thank the school board uh, and the superintendent staff for their support with our name change. Um, when you are able to visit, we have done a lot of rebranding. Uh, it's still ongoing, but um, our facility looks great, fantastic. And um, we're very excited about the upgrades that are still in progress. So I wanna thank you for the opportunity this evening. Um, and uh, I appreciate all the support during the pandemic. Um, and we are very excited that we have kids back in the building and we're uh, moving forward. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman Latif, school board members, and Dr. Waltz. My name is Giovanni Mitchell, principal of George Hampton Middle School. First, I would like to thank Mr. Bixby, who has been with all middle school, uh, <coughs> excuse me, who has been meeting with all middle school principals each week throughout the pandemic as we share and norm best practices within the middle school level. None of us have ever done this before. And it is great to be able to collaborate with our peers to find the best possible solutions for our students, families, and staff. This has not been easy for any of us, but it is good to be able to work through it together. Last week, we opened our doors for our incoming sixth grade students, our custodians, food service employees, administrative support staff, instructional technology coach, and technology specialists did an amazing job to prepare and welcome returning students and staff. On Thursday, February 25th, our first group of sixth grade students arrived. We were expecting 70 students, 40 reported to in-person learning. On Friday, February 26th, we were expecting 68 students and 38 students were in attendance. This in-person attendance was a surprise for my administrative team and I because we had done lots of planning and preparation to prepare for a return to learn in the school building. We had several town hall meetings and uh, <clears throat> we had several town hall meetings for our parents and school community. We sent numerous messages to our parents via school messenger as well as newspaper, newsletters to our families. Since the return to the building on February 25th, we noticed a daily trend where parents were changing their decision from in-person to virtual learning. I'm proud to say that this week, we successfully immersed our seventh and eighth grade students to in-person learning. Currently, we have 220 students attending in-person learning on Tuesdays and Thursdays and 185 students attending on Wednesdays and Fridays. Since September 8th, we've had 24 of our most vulnerable learners attending in-person learning four days a week. The remainder 673 students are attending school virtually. Our students who are in the building are happy to be there. School is nothing like they're remembered, but it is good to see their smiling faces under their masks even if we can only see their eyes. Our teachers were excited about seeing the students, but there were anxious moments because they did not know what to expect. I am proud to share with you that our students did an amazing job following the key mitigation strategies recommended by the CDC and adopted by PWCS. Students consistently and correctly wore masks, maintained six feet physical distancing, and they use hand sanitizers and wash their hands frequently. In addition, our custodians continue to clean and disinfect throughout the day using the recommended guidelines. Administrators work with teachers to ensure we kept good record of where students were sitting. We faced some staffing challenges due to the second vaccine. 12 substitute teachers were needed each day. With the support of Human Resources, Office of Professional Learning, and the Middle School Office, we were able to fill the gaps. As of today, we are facing eight unfilled substitute positions for Friday, March 5th. We are currently working on a plan to provide ample coverage for the unfilled substitute positions. Since February 17th, we've had two teachers retire, 
indicating that due to the return to building plan and your health concerns, they found this option to be necessary. Also, we have been notified that two teachers submitted their request for FMLA indicating the same reason. This continues to be a major challenge for the administrative team at Hampton Middle School. We continue to collaborate with the Office of Human Resources and Mr. Bixby for solutions to this ongoing problem. As I conclude, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the central office staff who came to Hampton Middle School to support our return to in-person instruction. Some were able to serve as substitute teachers as well as assist in other areas of supervision. I want to thank members of the school board, especially Chairman Latif, also Associate Superintendent for Special Education and Student Services, Denise Hebner, and all other personnel who were instrumental in providing our school staff access to the COVID-19 vaccine. The process was fluid, and I believe this will make a major difference as we approach the fourth quarter of the school year. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman Latif, Dr. Waltz, members of the school board. My name is Daria Groover, proud principal of Featherstone Elementary School, a Title I school in the Woodbridge District. We have welcomed back 189 pre-K through fifth grade students out of 500 since the beginning of the school year. 38% of our students have returned to in-person learning while 62% continue to learn in the virtual setting. We must remember that data comes in two forms, quantitative, the numbers, and qualitative, the stories behind the numbers. In our area code, the 22, excuse me, in our area, the 22191 zip code, COVID-19 has impacted many residents as the numbers show some of the highest transmission rates in Prince William County since the beginning of the pandemic. This could be the story behind why so many of our students remain virtual. Thanks to Dr. Waltz phased in return to learning, we have navigated how to welcome more students to in-person learning. This required planning for schedules, classroom teacher changes, coverage for bus duty, car riders, arrival, dismissal, lunch duty, walkers, and transitions in the hallways. We've been very successful each time we've had students return, which translated into nine first days of school. Staff who returned in person have learned how to successfully implement mitigation strategies, proper mask wearing, hand washing, use of hand sanitizers, and social distancing. Thanks to Prince William County Schools, all PPE is plentiful, and for that, we are thankful. Classrooms look very different now with the new guidelines, but our students and staff are happy to be back in school, even for two days per week. Mrs. Hart has walked the halls with me and observed strong instruction and in student learning. This last transition for fourth and fifth grade return was a bit more challenging due to the number of staff who received their second dose of the vaccine, but we, meet, we made it work by reallocating staff to support our in-person students. I do understand that central office worked with schools to provide support when teachers were absent. However, we did not need to request that support. Throughout the school year, teachers meet on Mondays in collaborative learning teams to plan instruction by using data from formative and summative assessments. They use the data, quantitative, to determine how students are performing. Our on-grade level reading percentage increased from fall to mid-year by 12%, from 54% to 66%. Currently, our average pass rate on math unit assessments is 70%. These numbers tell a story. Good tier one instruction is always the first step. If students struggle with tier one, we provide the following tier two and tier three strategies for students who are not achieving at the highest levels. Small groups with the classroom teacher, small groups with PALS tutors, 
with the ESAW teachers, with special education teachers and or reading teachers. Last week, we started our after school tutoring program for support in reading and math, where parents got to choose either in person or virtual. Teachers have prepared hands-on materials for students, including PALS packets, take-home books, art supplies, library books, packets of work that parents pick up in front of the school each week, and some teachers are meeting with students before and after school to provide additional support. Recently, we have been provided funding to hire temporary teacher assistants to support our students, which is greatly appreciated. We are providing enrichment opportunities as well. We're doing a third grade pink space theory program and a fifth grade science in a bag program. Each one of my teachers has stories, qualitative, on how they've met the needs of our very diverse student body during these challenging times. Thanks to Prince William County Schools, our students have the technology they need to access online instruction. We have given out 381 laptops and 21 hotspots to our families, and we have more available should anyone need them. Given that the Featherstone population is primarily Hispanic, we know that we must communicate clearly with parents to help them understand what they need to do to help us help their students. This includes having tech support daily. Our ITC and T-SPEC meet parents every day at the school to troubleshoot any issues that arise. As we've navigated bringing more students back to in-person learning, our bilingual staff have been instrumental in answering the host of questions that our parents have. We use Class Dojo as another means of communication. This has been a key to our successful partnership. Just last week, we hosted a Lexia Parent Night, where 85 families learned how to work with their children on this excellent literacy program provided by PWCS. Representatives from Lexia were very impressed with our level of bilingual collaboration with our community. Additionally, we communicate through a monthly s'mores newsletter for the community to keep families up to date. I'm very proud that the Featherstone School community has risen to the challenges of this unique year, and parents have become more active in their children's education by collaborating with the teachers. Although the challenges are great, the entire staff at Featherstone has worked extremely hard to provide a world-class education for our students during the 2020-21 school year. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, team, for sharing your journey with us tonight. Really appreciate that. We're going to now turn it over to Ms. Jarslyn Hart, Associate Superintendent for Western Schools, Western Elementary Schools, for an interactive panel discussion with these outstanding school leaders. Thank you, Mr. Provencio. Good evening, Chairman Latif, to the school board, and to <clears throat> Dr. Waltz. As your moderator, I am excited about the opportunity to share from this representation of world-class principals. They are honored to share their experiences of leading through the challenges and the rewards of the COVID-19 pandemic. These three principals represent the realities and the answers in the room. They are our boots on the ground principals. It is my understanding that you, our school board, has questions and maybe comments with this ever ready, willing, and capable principal group. Dr. Latif, absolutely, I will follow your lead. Well, Ms. Hart, thank you so much. Um, that was a very comprehensive uh, review of the first few weeks in, in the year from your fantastic principals. We might have a couple short questions here. We'll, uh, if the board members have, just please ask one question. Um, and then we'll um, go through a cycle or two of that, and then I think we can move on to the rest of the pandemic report. Um, I think I'll start uh, with Ms. Jackson. Hi, um, that was a wonderful, comprehensive, as uh, Dr. Latif said, presentation that actually answered a lot of my questions. So um, I 
think my question for right now is about the SOL test. A lot of students are anxious about it. So if we could just speak to the SOL tests and the mandates from the federal government to kind of take this opportunity to explain the assessments and how they're gonna be done in the high school level. Thank you. Dr. Nichols, please. Uh, so Ms. Jackson and the board, uh, so SOLs are certainly a challenge uh, during uh, this pandemic and uh, hybrid learning. Um, we have been testing students uh, in person uh, since December. Um, so we've been bringing students in uh, to uh, test. One of the challenges that we do have is that the uh, virtual students, which is about 70% of our student population, is getting them into the building. Um, but they, you know, they are coming in. Um, students do have the opportunity to test opt out, but it is a graduation requirement as well. So there is that, uh, you know, caveat that, you know, you have to, you know, you can opt out, but you have to understand that it is something that you do need if you do wish to graduate. So um, we're working with the other principals. Uh, you know, Mr. Mulgrew, we've had a number of meetings um, uh, to discuss all of the various issues. And I want to thank his leadership and all of the high school principals for their support uh, during this pandemic. Um, but the challenge is real, uh, especially when we get to full testing. Um, right now we're uh, de dealing with pr predominantly students who needed like a makeup test or someone who did not pass last year, as well as seniors. Um, but getting students into the building and transportation and other things are things that we're working on to try to address. Um, the testing window will be in May. Um, but like I said, there is the, the ability for students who are virtual to choose not to test uh, for the SOL, but it is still a graduation requirement. And I don't know if, um, you know, additional information will be provided by the state uh, for that. Okay, thank you. Ms. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think that this uh, panel presentation was, as um, stated before, very informative and comprehensive. I really uh, extremely appreciate hearing from someone in my district this time. Um, and what a great representative, um, Dr. Groover. I appreciate you coming to speak on behalf. I think we don't acknowledge Title I schools at all levels as much as we should. They have been a shining star during the pandemic and extremely well prepared and well suited to pivot um, due to their ongoing close nature relationships with the community and parents to simply because of the nature of the student body that they serve. Uh, my question at this time is at the high school level, and I have a few other questions, but we'll just do one at a time. Um, are high schools referring um, anyone from their base schools to independence non-traditional to assist with credit recovery? Is that something that is actively being done? And I'm, I, Dr. Nichols, I don't expect you to know for every single high school principal. I know you're a representative, but I know that um, teachers right now are overburdened with concurrent teaching. We do have a loss of uh, instructional time, and I was wondering if we are utilizing independence to sort of assist those students um, with credit recovery. Let's hear from Dr. Nichols, and then he'll, we'll follow with um, Mr. Mulgrew. Uh, so we have had, obvi uh, not obviously, but we have had less students that we've referred to um, independence. Um, and I, you know, being a neighbor of New Direction slash Independence for many years, I can highlight that it, is, it has been a, a great relationship and they do an outstanding job. I mean, it's certainly something that we will look to. Um, in the beginning of the year, we had probably more students that opted to uh, transfer, um, but it is an ongoing process. One of the challenges obviously is uh, getting students in a virtual environment uh, to transfer to a different building. So it's something we'll certainly explore. And one of the things that I think will be very supportive and helpful is during the summer when we have seniors that do not graduate, uh, we traditionally have them finish up um, through their programs through credit recovery. Uh, and we will certainly utilize uh, Mr. Eichhorn and independence uh, through that process. But it's, it's definitely less, but it's uh, still something that we do provide as an option to families. Please, Mr. Mulgrew. 
Ms. Williams, we also allow high schools to run ed mentor programs in their own buildings. Um, so if you have students that need, uh, almost every high school has the ability, or they all have the ability to run ed mentor right there to pick up the credits at their local high school, either after the hours or something along those lines, and they can pick them up inside their buildings as well. Are, but are we encouraging them to, because, you know, the teachers are doing double duty. So I'm sorry if my question wasn't phrased sort of um, in that direction. We are encouraging teachers to, to who are willing to take on this extra responsibility. And um, we're trying to provide them incentives to be able to do that. And uh, yeah, we've had throughout the years, we've had a tremendous amount of schools, high schools, regular high schools using it, but we always do realize that Bob uh, or independence is waiting for us right there when we need them. Mrs. Goss, would you like to add to this particular question or an answer? So uh, Mrs. Hart, school board members, uh, I, I would just echo uh, what was already said that, you know, INS is, is serving students um, now and they, um, are always willing uh, to uh, have other students come to them as they're referred or as students and their families um, select uh, to have a non-traditional um, program. Uh, so um, the INS staff, as has already been said, are um, outstanding at uh, individualizing um, plans for students and um, providing flexible ways in which students can um, earn those credits and most importantly, learn what they need to learn to be successful after they graduate from high school. Uh, so um, uh, INS is, is there and we're continuing to promote uh, what that offers and, and their colleagues in the high schools uh, are referring students. It may be a little less because of the, the pandemic and the other options that are available. Uh, but um, I anticipate that that partnership will uh, continue to be strong and uh, the INS staff is uh, ready to uh, support uh, students and families and, and our schools uh, in any way possible. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, Ms. Wall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my question is, um, I don't remember who who said this, but they said that um, extracurricular activities or athletics have already begun. Um, and I know that's happening across the district, but my question is, can you tell me um, what other kinds of activities are beginning to be offered in person that are extracurricular? Because obviously sports has moved forward, but can you give me some insight into maybe robotics or um, like chamber orchestras or um, you know other key club any any anything else that we have going on and what are the plans for um, some of those other extracurriculars you know that would arguably arguably be easier to mitigate than than sports sure dr grover please thank you For, for us right now, we're focused more on the academic piece. That's why we started our after school tutoring program last week. Our students um, do have their encore classes. So they are receiving uh, opportunities in music, art, library, and physical education. At this point in the year, we have not started to offer the um, additional opportunities for our students simply because we've been uh, navigating how to get the kids back in the building for for instruction. That that definitely can be a next step, though. Mrs. Mitchell, please. You want to unmute? Thank you. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Mrs. Hart and Mrs. Wall. At Hampton Middle School, we currently have several clubs and academic uh, programs in place. As of right now, they are all virtual. We have students who participate in drama, Latin dance, literary magazine, uh, the yearbook club, books of fun, as well as the after-school remediation in mathematics and language arts. 
Uh, since September, teachers have dedicated their time to having extracurricular activities for students. Uh, as we know that during this time, things are difficult, so we try to make each day fun for each and every one of them. Uh, as far as in-school programs, we're in the process of getting that uh, together. As of today, all of our students who are now in person have attended um, either one or two days. So we haven't had a chance to get those groups to participate in uh, in-person clubs and activities. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wilk. Oh, thank you. Did you want to have, did anyone from high school want to answer that? Sorry. Uh, so just share that, you know, we had a, um, you know, the athletic uh, piece, uh, our SALC, our Student Activities Leadership Council has been very active uh, with uh, various orientation. Um, they do come in and provide uh, support for uh, our One of Us videos, as well as we've had a virtual law club, um, as well as um, Scholastic Bowl. Um, so some of the clubs are able to maintain uh, their status virtually. Um, the SALC also did a very good job with our Black History Month with the virtual presentation. Um, but as we, you know, transition, and I think some of the other levels indicated, you know, as you get more students into the building, having some more additional opportunities for extracurricular activities beyond sports, um, our band is certainly starting to get uh, get ready for our first football game on March 13th. Um, and I went to the Patriot uh, Unity Read football game and the Patriot band uh, uh, was able to be in the stands um, and they were able to have spectators and uh, cheerleaders uh, in the dance team. So I know that we're gearing up to get back into uh, more offerings for students beyond athletics. Okay, thank you, sorry about that. Mr. Wilk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate the three of you being here tonight uh, and for your time. Um, question, uh, do any of the three of you, uh, now I noticed online, I've been to two of your buildings and I uh, apologize, Dr. Groove, I've never been to Featherstone, so I did a quick Google of what the building looks like. So they're, the three of your buildings are relatively older buildings. Um, and so my question is, do any of you have concerns with, with your building's HVAC systems? And if you have concerned staff about this, how have you helped assuage those concerns? So this answer may be a short um, yes or no answer. And let's go ahead and start with Dr. Groover again, the elementary level. Okay, thank you for the question, Mr. Wilk. Um, Honestly, we do not have any concerns with our HVAC system. Anytime that, if there's a day that it's cold in a classroom, we just put in a work order and someone comes out immediately. So that is not a concern for us. Ms. Mitchell? We do not have a concern with our HVAC uh, system either. Uh, throughout the fall, facilities came through our building and uh, checked, on the, checked on the system each day and made any necessary repairs. So we're in a good place with the HVAC system. And last, Dr. Nichols. Um, any concerns were addressed through the interactive process. Um, and I would, I would um, not being an HVAC expert, um, I would say, you know, that it's one thing that we did work with facilities to try to provide answers to any individual staff that had concerns about our um, HVAC uh, and our fil filtration system. Thank you. Wonderful. Miss Jessie. Uh, good evening. As I listen to the high schools and middle and elementary, I'm not sure it's a problem at elementary, but I don't see it as a problem. First of all, I want to thank you for being here and sharing with us tonight. Uh, the class sizes, um, I think I heard uh, at Stonewall you had a smaller return for uh, in-person, and at the middle, I think I heard Ms. Mitchell say the same thing. I'm not sure it's true at elementary. I've talked to some principals, and 
many of them are kind of surprised at the small turnout <clears throat> and have class sizes in some instances of one to a class. So could you address that, each one of you? Uh, what do you, if that is an issue, an issue what do you account, what do you, what do you see as the reason for the smaller uh, return of students? Because it's a small number of students in, in many instances. Dr. Nichols, please. Um, so just to give you a, you know, a rough idea, our, our numbers have kind of flipped from last year. Uh, we had roughly, um, I can't remember exactly, but essentially we had about 40% of our students that were electing to come in person. And now it's gone down to about, you know, 30%, although only 20% are showing up. Um, I think there's a number of factors, the lateness of the year, um, that some of the successes of virtual learning have been certainly attributed to the fact that students um, feel that, you know, they're getting their needs met in a virtual environment. Um, as you transition throughout the school year, um, the lateness of the year, I think there are certain students that uh, are reluctant to return during the pandemic, um, the unknown. Uh, of what school will be like, um, not having the opportunity to, um, it's, it's, it's not normal. It's, it's certainly something that we've never experienced. Um, you know, you go to the cafeteria and you have assigned seating at a high school level, which is not something that they've been accustomed to. Um, so that's, that's certainly a, an issue. Um, you know, I think the students that, one thing I've heard that the students that are returning is they like the structure, I meaning there's no distractions from home. Um, so I think there's just a variety of factors. I don't think you can pinpoint any one reason why kids are electing to stay virtual. Um, but I, I do think that it's a positive thing that we're back in the buildings, that we're getting teachers back in the buildings, students back in the buildings, and we're giving kids and teachers an opportunity to um, navigate this new, new learning environment for the end of the year. And moving forward, it will be something that we can build upon. Um, lower than numbers than expected. Um, but um, I think, you know, families um, have their various reasons uh, for why not to come back to in-person learning. So it's hard to pinpoint. There's no one answer. Mrs. Mitchell. Okay. As you are aware, Hampton is a majority minority school and our zip code has been hit or one of the zip codes that has been hit the hardest with COVID-19 uh, cases in Prince William County. Our African-American and Latinos have been hit the hardest also with COVID. As a result, our parents are extra careful about sending their students to school. We've had several incidents where family members of students have um, suffered from COVID and in some cases they're, they experience death. So our community, they're really very careful about sending students to school because of those concerns. Thank you, Dr. Gruber. How I want to echo what ahead. Ms. Mitchell said. It's, it's a very similar situation at Featherstone. Um, our in-person classes right now go anywhere from, we have a couple classes where it's two students in person up to the most we have in a classroom right now is nine. And um, it, it's going to be a challenge if we have a lot more because the, the rooms are small in these older schools. Those The pods have those high shaped classrooms and um, with the upper grade students who are bigger kids, that could be a challenge depending on how many more students come in. but. As of right now, everything is, is fine, but I think that's why the parents are um, keeping their children at home. Could I get a class size from middle and high school on average? For the high school, it's three to four. For middle school, the average class size is four to five students. Just a follow-up to that, are 
Are we looking at ways to increase the in-school learning? Have you guys thought of some ways to do that? I mean, the survey is open, uh, not survey, but the option for parents to contact us. We've been accommodating uh, students um, and parents for fourth quarter. Um, obviously, it's an individual family choice, um, but we certainly have are not um, we're receptive to students who wish to return in person. I really think the other thing I would say is just the, you know, the, the time change uh, was certainly an impact as far as starting the school at seventh day at 730 for high school. Um, and then just the, you know, as students and get comfortable with, uh, you know, three quarters of the year almost being over. Um, it's, I think next year, obviously, we'll be in a very different position, but we're almost to the fourth quarter and um, students have made their decision um, and parents. And it's not much different from what was in January. We had about a thousand students that selected uh, in person and now we're about 800. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know how to get more kids to come back into the building at this point in time of the year. At Hampton, we are reaching out to parents whose students are struggling academically um, in the virtual setting. Our counselors are making phone calls to parents requesting that those kids be brought back into the building. It has worked for some parents, but not all, but we've not gone through every single parent yet. We're still in the process. So we're, we're hoping to increase those numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ralston. Do you have any questions, Ms. Ralston? Jason, can I see the um, screen? Ms. Ralston, Ms. Ralston, you're on mute. You need to unmute yourself. Okay, is that there? Is that okay? Okay. Very good. good. Well, let, let, me, let me just say simply uh, and keep moving fast, hopefully. Um, I, think we've, I think you've done a, a real yeoman's kind of job. And it wasn't an everyday kind of thing that you came up with. You know, you walked up one more, woke up one morning and all of, all of these things were fa facing you. So thank you very much. And so that's all. Great. Um, I guess at this point, um, anyone have any questions? Oh, yeah, Ms. Sargapur, I'm sorry. Yeah, just one. Thank you, Dr. Latif. Um, so I, I know that the, 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 we have had more technology issues going on, um, and some of you have mentioned that your T-Specs and your ITCs have been working constantly. Do, do we need more of those positions across the division? Um, to help support what's going on? Uh, do you, is, is it work that has been constantly increasing over time or has it just sort of been steady or, or, or what have you seen? Please, Dr. Groover. That is a, a great question. Um, as I said in my comments, um, our community really needs a lot of support with technology. And um, so between our ITC and our T-SPEC, um, they have to be there every day to provide that support. Now the T-SPEC position is split between two schools. So that person is not there every day. And um, someone asked earlier about SOL testing and as testing comes around, um, that is going to become a challenge because those folks are setting up computers for testing and getting rooms ready for that and getting the devices ready. So um, if that were available, we could certainly use it uh, to have the T-SPEC full-time as well as have, we do have the ITC full-time, but with the addition of the technology in the classrooms, 
um, the cameras and the laptops and the teachers are using their smart boards. It, it's a lot. And the RT specs and ITCs have been working nonstop. So moving forward, uh, we're going to keep technology. So this sounds like something that we need to be thinking about um, in terms of, of um, it, it sounds like the elementary schools need their own dedicated people, but I'm also interested in middle and high school. Is one enough in your building? Now that we have virtual learning, I would have to say that one is not enough. I have a full-time T-SPEC and also um, a full-time instructional uh, technology coach. Both are spread thin throughout the building. They are running around helping teachers who may have technology issues, also working with students, uh, repairing devices, checking devices, and so forth. They are definitely spread thin. And if we are continuing with virtual learning, we will definitely need additional staff. Dr. Latif. Um, yeah, let me, I was, I think some of them had their hands up over here. Um, hold on one sec, Ms. Jesse. Um, well, did he want to, Mr. Nichols, did, Dr. Nichols, did you need to answer on that? Um, there are certainly uh, challenges. Um, we've had one-to-one -one in various phases um, at Stonewall, now Unity Read. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's a broader discussion uh, that needs to, you know, be considered. So I, I don't really want to weigh in to my individual situation, but they do work very hard. And obviously the pandemic has stretched everyone. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. Ms. Ar um, Jackson. Um, I just wanna thank everybody for coming tonight. I don't actually have any additional questions, but I'm okay. very, it was a very helpful presentation and addressed a lot of my concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Ms. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and uh, just again, thank you to the principals who are on this panel discussion. I'd like to um, thank Dr. Grover and uh, Ms. Mitchell for pointing out the needs of, you know, uh, students who reside in COVID hot zones and how different it is, um, especially with African American community and the Latino community. Um, I know in my community, it is a it, it's a privilege if you see a child in a store with their parents shopping at times because the children aren't out. It's a privilege to. Um, you know, see them out at a playground in the community because they're not out. You may see them playing in their own yard, in their own backyard, but they're not out in public. They're not going to the stores. They're not going shopping with their parents. They're not out. A lot of people in my communities are single household earners. It's not worth the risk to their family, no matter what the school division or anybody else says. It's just not worth the risk. I leave my house as a sole owner. My child does not leave unless necessary. And um, not because I'm forcing him, but he also understands the risk involved and chooses not to go out as well. Um, so I think that that, when we talk about bias and privilege, I think that that's something to recognize for some of our COVID hot zones. And we have to be very careful about asking parents to ask, have their students come back into a building because that it could be a life or death, a sustain family sustainability issue for those family members, um, which does trump their student's education because that's something they can make up later. If somebody dies, you can't make that up. Um, so my question is, how are our teachers handling the stress of in-person learning when it comes to timing and schedules? Is there really enough time? Is it additionally stressful for them now that they have to do concurrent learning and be janitors during the day and be hall monitors and bus monitors and run after school programs and do credit recovery and um, you know fill in for tech people and um, also have time to enter grades and talk to parents and run additional supports within the school. Um, I think this has been an extremely draining year and I was wondering if we have surveyed our staff members um, on how they are adjusting to this in-person learning struggle um, because I think that they have now uh, have had to undertake even further additional responsibilities throughout their day. So Ms. Williams, we'll start with the three principals and then we'll follow with um, Dr. Casada because you mentioned the possibility of, of a survey. But just um, from day-to-day -day interactions, Dr. Nichols, would you like to talk about how your teachers are sustaining and maintaining? Um, so there were a number of concerns about coming back to the building um, after um, you know, a long hiatus. Um, I, I do think that there are um, 
certainly challenges presented by that as far as child care and not only child care but also <clears throat> just you know we're, we're looking at any individual who has worked virtually for an entire year now you're bringing them back into the building or you know a work environment um, and, and there's certainly pros and cons to both uh, situations um, the relatively few uh, students that we have in the buildings right now in their classrooms um, present challenges but also I do see that you know our staff are responding in a professional manner um, and I you know I, I can't we've only been back for you know my staff came back last week uh, ninth grade teachers came back Thursday Friday all teachers came back Tuesday Wednesday um, certainly you see smiling faces. I mean, they haven't seen each other in some cases for a year. Um, so I think it's too early to make a determination on the long-term impact or short-term impact of um, their workload. But I, I do understand, I think the biggest thing to recognize that I've tried to uh, share with my staff is it's, a, it's an adjustment. Um, and, uh, you know, we're all adjusting to a new normal. The new normal right now is that We've uh, been vaccinated, hopefully, as a staff, and that we are in the middle of a pandemic that is not over, um, and that you know we're finishing a school year. So I've tried to keep the eyes on the focus of the students that are in the building, um, in the sense that we do have a number of students that um, have been out of school for a year, and we want to make sure that they have the best possible experience. Um, but yes, it is an adjustment for staff. At the middle level, Mrs. Mitchell. Our teachers and staff are overwhelmed and overworked uh, doing the virtual teaching and now the concurrent learning. Um, it is twice the work or maybe triple the work that they're used to. Um, they're definitely feeling stress and anxiety. And in addition to that, they're worried about their health and contracting COVID. So um, there's a lot of stress and anxiety and worry over the entire situation, especially when you're in a school like mine, and you know that within the community, there are many cases and we're the hotspot. Um, it just brings a lot more anxiety onto the staff. Thank you. Thank you. Our staff at Featherstone, it, it's a wide variety of how people feel right now. Um, you have to remember we've had some staff and some teachers who have been there since the very beginning with our most vulnerable learners. Those folks are tired because they've been doing this, you know, for month after month. And our staff has not been taking days off. They, they, they work, not that they can't, but they understand that, you know, the challenge um, of trying to find um, folks who can do all of this that they have learned how to do. Um, I'll also say that, as Ms. Mitchell said, they're, they're overwhelmed and overworked, um, but they keep going the extra mile. Right now, we're in the middle of WIDA testing. And when you have a school where 70% of your students are English learners, and those children are being asked to be tested in person, my ESOL team is going above and beyond trying to test on Mondays because they don't want to take away from the instruction on Tuesday through Friday. So um, it, it is exhausting. And the, the ESOL team is coming in on Monday and they're testing kids until five and six o'clock at night because the WIDA test is in four parts and we don't want the kids to take all four parts in one sitting. So the parents are having to bring them back and take them back. And we just recently did COGAT testing and Naglieri. So um, my assistant principal, Mrs. Legui and I try our very best to keep very upbeat with our staff. Um, we tell them, every time we see them, how much we appreciate them. They are heroes and they, they just deserve so much recognition for what they're doing 
their Herculean efforts are truly amazing. So um, as far as their their um, health and well-being and mental state, um, it, it's it's difficult for sure. It, it really is. And I know that they're counting down till spring break because they need a rest. Great, thank you. Ms. Wall? Um, I echo the thanks of everybody, you know, that everybody has said for coming here tonight and speaking to us on, on this evening. I have a question. Um, I've had a lot of conversations with music students um, and teachers in my district, um, and I know a lot of kids who are involved in the, the fine and performing arts. Um, and there are some particularly significant challenges that are being faced by music programs in our division. Um, you know, imagine a, a basketball team practicing, you know, getting ready for their games without actually having a ball to practice with. And for a lot of our music students, that's kind of the situation that they're facing right now. And for our teachers as well, it's, it's a great challenge. Um, and we all know, you know, the, the reasons, et cetera. But I was wondering if we, you could please address the challenges that our music teachers are facing in your various levels and what recommendations you would have moving forward for our music um, teachers and programs um, as restrictions ease in the coming weeks and months. So how can we, you know, give them their ball, basically, so that they can, you know, move forward with their music education in a really meaningful way? Well, while we're getting ready to uh, have the principals respond to that, Ms. Wall, I just want to make a clarification. You said imagine a basketball team playing without a ball. Uh, you're not suggesting that students don't have instruments, are you? I know that orchestra can play, although I don't know how much. I know choir students aren't singing and band students aren't playing. So they aren't playing their instruments. That's, that's what I'm saying. Okay. We, we can have the principals respond to that, but we may have to look at that centrally because months and months ago, I authorized the ordering of PPE. And uh, at least I know where my daughter is going to school. She's an orchestra. They're, they're playing. Um, the band rehearses outside and have their um, coverings, their mitigation coverings uh, that are designed for specific uh, instruments. I'm not sure about the choir, but we can follow up centrally, but we'll, in fairness, let the principals respond. I thought the nipples is ready. Uh, so our first uh, home football game is not until March 13th. Um, as I mentioned in my remarks, uh, I did attend the Patriot Unity Read um, game um, last Friday night, and we played Battlefield this Friday night. Uh, the band was performing at uh, the the home team. Uh, Patriot was performing at the, a game. They had the away bleachers because uh, that's just the arrangement we worked out. Um, and so there were I don't know how many students performing, but uh, they were they were performing. So our band is uh, pet band is getting ready. It's not the traditional marching band. Although I would like to thank Dr. Waltz and. The school board because we did get our new unity, unity read marching band uniforms in um, so thank you um, it was something that's taken about a year to get but uh i don't say a year but it, it just takes a while to, to produce marching band uniforms uh, and then you know the orchestra obviously can perform um so the teachers are in class now um, i don't know what the end of the year will look like as far as any performances um, in person, and then certainly the choir will have some different challenges. Um, but um, yeah, the band was great at Patriot High School, and we'll we'll be ready when we get an opportunity to perform at a home game. Okay, Mr. Wilk. I think Ms. Mitchell wanted to respond, Chairman. Yes, sure. I just wanted to say that at Hampton, all of our students in orchestra, guitar, and um, band have instruments. Uh, those who are home have the instruments at home. Those who are now in person have the instrument at school. Um, the biggest challenge for music teachers is synchronizing the music as students are playing. Um, as a result, our music teachers have been very creative. Uh, students have been doing lots of uh, solo performances or 
partner performances. Um, but overall, our students are engaging in music. They are playing the instruments and they're just enjoying um, their time in music class. Can I ask a clarifying question? Um, are your students playing their band instruments in school? Um, or, and are they um, singing in school? I'm assuming with masks on. Um, are they, you know, if they're playing their band instruments in school, are they playing them with the special PPE that we've heard about for band instruments? Or are kids coming to school? I know it's only been a week, but are they coming mm -hmm. to school to a band <laughs> class and, and just sitting their instrument? You know, maybe just, I don't know what they're doing. Actually, if you could speak to that. Okay, students have not started playing their instruments yet. Um, this week is day two for our sixth grade students and day one for seventh and eighth grade students. So pretty much our music teachers are going over protocols and expectations. Um, they have a slew of expectations that they need to go over and review with students before they can start actually uh, playing instruments. We want to hear from elementary principal, Dr. Gruber, about the music program. Um, at the elementary level, um, classroom music is, um, you know, it really has to be modified because a majority um, of elementary music um, involves singing and dancing and moving and playing instru classroom instruments and so forth. So we have had to make a lot of modifications to that. Um, but similarly with the strings, um, our strings teacher has been teaching his students virtually. Um, and since the fifth grade students just came back, I'm not quite sure what that is going to look like in the classroom. I don't know how many of his students are actually in person. And um, so we're working that out, but we're, we're doing the best that we can given the situation and the uh, protocols we have to follow. So I, I would like to share my, I just asked my uh, son who's in fifth grade at Bristol Run Elementary and he's uh, has started playing the violin. And he said that he did play the violin today for the first time in class in person. Um, you know, at the high school level, we've had a, a small number of in-person students. So, I mean, they, that's a part of the challenge with the instructors uh, having, but I mean, I think we're obviously doing our best and, you know, looking at uh, opportunities for students to perform. Um, in person and get the best experience they can. So if I could maybe book in this by saying that, uh, again, we'll look into it centrally. Um, you know, I've had a lot of uh, interaction at the high schools with high school students and uh, there may be differences in the load. In other words, the enrollment, the numbers of students that are in uh, certain choirs and there are pretty strict requirements for vocal music, um, I, I have I don't want to quote them, but I know it's at least ten foot distance. And for example, I've been in a number of those uh, classes. And uh, Miss Wall, if you're referring to Battlefield, there there's a huge vocal music program out there with with uh, enormous numbers of students. Um, and that's that's not the only school uh, that has large numbers of vocal students. But we'll look into that from a central uh, standpoint. And again, um, just so you know, there are pretty strict requirements from VDH on the rec on the uh, distance uh, with vocal music and with band. It's, is VDH the guiding um, entity that's giving out guidelines of what can be done in a music class or with a band, you know, for instance, a band class, a choir class, an orchestra class? Is it VDH that we're looking to for guidance? On that in VDH, particular? they work in tandem with uh, the Virginia Health Department and also the CDC. So what they do is whenever new guidance comes out, they try to align themselves. So uh, everything is on the same page, but we'll look into that. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Mr. Wilk. Okay, last question, right? Okay, yeah. um, thank, you. thank you all again. Um, thank you all again. Um, 
you know, and I understand I give our division major credit for launching a brand new LMS this year and everything on a short run. Uh, one of the frustrations I hear is with the LTI, which is the Learning Tools Interoperability System. Uh, for those of you listening, it's basically like a common ecosystem for a bunch of different platforms to interact with one another, kind of cohesion. Um, and from a high school level, uh, it appears a lot of times I'm hearing from teachers that when kids move to different sections in Canvas, it creates a whole new grade book. And some teachers have 30 different grade books uh, as a result of some of the changes that are happening with the schedules and such like that. So my question, I know that's particularly high school, but my question for the three principals would be, what are some of the common complaints with kind of some of the systems or the technology uh, that we as a school system could use moving forward? Because uh, this, all this equipment's not going away. We didn't just buy all these cameras and all this stuff just to waste a bunch of taxpayer money. So moving forward, I imagine we're gonna leverage a lot of this stuff. So just curious, what, uh, what are some of the common concerns you are hearing? Thank you, Dr. Nichols. Um, so I think the various platforms communicating with one another, um, and I, you know, I don't wanna, <clears throat> I, I think every time you make a house change, whether it's a virtual student going from in-person to virtual, or from house A to B, um, there's a number of steps that have to be followed to make sure that the grades are accurate. And I don't know who the accurate, who the person um, that's on this uh, Zoom meeting or webinar this evening could answer that, but there's a lot of frustrations from teachers that, um, you know, we're constantly flipping students from house A to house B or in person to virtual or virtual and um, it's not sinking, so it definitely is a challenge. Ms. Mitchell, you want to add to that? Um, I would say one of the frustration with teachers is that Canvas and the gradebook are not in sync. Um, you will find parents, when they go into parent view, may find grades in Canvas and then grades in the gradebook. And in some cases, parents will look at the grades and say, well, when I looked in Canvas, my child's average was an A, and now it's a C. And they don't see the connection that basically it's two separate gradebook when you think about it. And um, until the teachers move all the grades over into the gradebook, it can create some confusion um, with parents. And overall, as far as using the technological tools, teachers have received so much training. Our students have been using technology since September. At the beginning of the year, if you ask this question, I would say that there was quite a struggle with both, both teachers and students. Now they're all familiar with the tools. They're all familiar with technology. So you hear very little complaint. Um, you see very little frustration when it comes to working with technology. And many of my teachers have told me um, the good that has come out of the pandemic is that they've learned so much with technology and now they will not go back to some of the ways that they taught because of all of these new tools that they see as a benefit to learning. That's exciting. Dr. Groover. I agree with um, the, the comments that Ms. Mitchell made. Um, at the elementary level, I just believe that the teachers have, um, they're trying their hardest to embrace every thing that comes along. But it, it's, again, it's a lot. So they've mastered how to use Canvas. They, you know, they had mastered the hub last year and Gradebook. Um, now we're trying to ease into using Mastery Connect, um, which is um, an assessment system to help us look at our data. So it, all I'll say is that they just need time to digest everything. They, they still have not had an opportunity to digest all of the technology, um, but I don't feel that there's anything different than the other levels have said. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Jesse. 
<clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this has been very interesting because um, there, <clears throat> there's an elephant in the room, and the room, the elephant in the room is that our teachers are exhausted. And I talked to principals today, and I, I heard the following, and maybe some of you have heard this, and I don't know if you'd be willing to share, uh, but. One of the things that I heard today was that um, in some instances, school opened, brand new kids were coming in, and they had 25 subs. That these new kids walked into a classroom and did not have a teacher there because they needed subs, because many of the teachers were out. I think I want to, you know, I, I think we've done a tremendous job with the uh, vaccine. But the elephant to me is that I've been a principal and I can't imagine what it must be like to have to call for 25 subs and cover classes because you have to cover classes. I'm told on a positive note that, and maybe you guys can address this, that they don't have um, <clears throat> mitigation problems because there are so few kids that they don't have to mitigate. You know, they don't have the, these uh, situations. Uh, principals, I want to compliment you. I was a principal and I can't imagine what it must be like, but the thing I know about principals and I know about teachers is that you'll come in this room and say, we'll do anything you want. And I heard that tonight, that teachers are willing to do anything we want. I don't know how we go back to fix that because I think sometimes we're patting ourselves on the back as a school division because we're the first. And I have to ask at what cost? I don't know how we go back to fix that. So I'm asking the associate superintendents and the superintendents to, I don't know if you need to have a teacher town hall or something, but there are, Teachers, and the other thing I heard from a principal, and maybe you guys can address, is that teachers felt that they worked before. They didn't have a summer. They, they've worked before summer. They've worked before school start. They, they, they asked for a couple of weeks, and we didn't give that to them. And now they're looking at all these after-school programs and they're looking at, are we going to have another summer because we're going to be working them through the summer? I guess maybe I'm just venting for people who are not venting or who are venting to me and to other people. But uh, I, I just think that this whole empathy piece is something that we really need to look at. And I think we're going to have to go back and fix it because I just think that people, and I've seen, I mean, all of us as principals have overworked people, and I know when my people are overworked, and I need to pull back. But as a division, I think we've done a wonderful job of bringing kids in, and we're patting ourselves on the back uh, for bringing all these people in, but I just think that our teachers and administrators if you're like me, you're not going to complain too much, but substitutes having to call up 25 subs and watching all this happen in your schools, I want to thank you for sharing some of the challenges tonight. And I guess I'm just talking, and maybe some principals want to comment on it. I uh, appreciate the fact that those kids in those uh, high COVID areas were discussed tonight. Why are they not coming back? And how do we get them in? So uh, if anyone wants to comment, I just, I, I congratulate all of you because I think, honestly, we put a lot on you. So thank you very much. And if you want to comment on the substitute situation and trying to get the vaccines and 
these teachers who were ill and were out of school. Could somebody just comment on that for me? And again, I just thank you. I just think we've overworked you. Um, Ms. Jesse, thank you for acknowledging uh, the very um, challenging work that our principals and teachers have, have accepted and have worked, worked really hard to, to do for the good of our school division. Um, I wouldn't dare challenge that it's been extremely um, laborious yet rewarding work. But the folks who are here tonight, they, they look in the face and the eyes of the teachers every day and they have conversations with the teachers. And um, we recognize that the, the days following the, the COVID-19 vaccinations were, were challenging days. And let's talk about how we met that challenge. And Dr. Groove, are you ready? This is Jesse. Thank you for um, acknowledging how difficult this work is. Um, it, it truly is. Uh, but I want to point out something that I haven't heard said tonight. I do believe that even though the teachers are exhausted um, and they're working harder than they ever have before, I think it's brought us all closer together because we have to work together to make things happen. And um, I'm very happy that this year um, I have less teachers um, who have indicated that they're leaving at the end of the year. Um, they want to stay. So the, the teamwork aspect that has come out of this exhaustion and how we're holding one another up, th there's something to be said for that as well. Um, but uh, as far as the substitute situation, we were able, because we're not a huge school like a middle school or a high school, we were able to, some of the ESAW teachers stepped in and covered and um, we were able, if they were small enough numbers, we could put kids together um, in, in bigger spaces and so forth. So even though that was a challenge, in my mind, I kept thinking this is temporary because we've got to get these folks vaccinated. This is a one day, two day, three day situation and then we're going to move on and we're gonna have more people who are fully vaccinated. So I just kept that message in mind and we made it work. And I think we're through the roughest part of that situation. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, I think we have Ms. Zargapur, did you have a question? Okay, Ms. Williams has one final question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know you love third round so much. Um, so I just, again, want to express to all of you how much I appreciate you being here and for um, giving us your perspective this evening. I know it, you have other work to do. Um, I just wanted to ask a question, and I'm sorry, because I know it can be uncomfortable to be put on the spot, but there are so many things that um, board members and just the members of the public, we don't think about because we're not sitting in your seats. And I wanted to provide you all the opportunity to discuss the known unknowns to us. You know, what are some of the things that we don't talk about or we should talk about um, that we wouldn't, it wouldn't occur, right, for a board member or someone who doesn't sit in your seat as we um, continue on this path of having students return into the building where maybe from the perspective of where you are now or in preparation from the fall, that would be very helpful to us who make these decisions and members of the public, things that they should be considering um, when they come to petition us board members to make decisions. Um, we often don't get the opportunity to hear directly from you and I think that that's a critical um, question to ask and I know it can be a little nerve wracking because it does put you on the spot. So I appreciate that and I just really again appreciate you being here. Oh, and I'm sorry, Dr. Casada, you could just follow up with me with the teacher survey because somehow we, we skipped you, but I, I remember. Okay, that's, a, um, that's an awesome, amazing question. And um, I, I feel like transparency is, is essential. And the main reason we have principals here is because we want reality and we want to hear from boots on the ground. And so what is it that we may not be aware of that we, you think the public and the school board need to hear that's happening or not happening through this pandemic? Let's start with Mrs. Mitchell. Thank you. 
I believe um, one of the things that the school board and um, our superintendent staff, superintendent staff need to be aware of, it, it comes from what Mrs. Jesse mentioned earlier about students walking into the building expecting to see their teachers, but instead they have a substitute in the classroom. You can see the disappointment on the student's face because they were really excited about meeting that specific teacher in person. So that's a difficult um, situation for a student, especially when you have a student who may be um, experiencing social emotional issues, um, issues at home, and school is always their safe place. And having a relationship with teachers is also a safe haven for them. So um, for students, a sub is a stranger. You see them once in a while here and there, but a teacher is there, and for many for life, <laughs> they build that relationship. They have that communication. They can open up and talk about just about anything. Um, so that's definitely a key piece, as Mrs. Jesse mentioned. Um, working in Prince William County, and you all are aware, our teachers are very vocal. <laughs> so we're all aware of um, some of their concerns, struggles, and so forth. So for the most part, I think overall, teachers have shared with all of us um, their feelings and how this experience is going for, for them and what they expect us to change in the future. And, and basically all I can say is to listen to the voices of the teachers. They're in the schools, they're doing the job, um, they know what's going on and they can tell us about their experiences and the experience of the students in the building. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges that we've had is, you know, teachers have been very understanding and, you know, understanding the situations of individual students this year as we move forward next year uh, to whatever, um, you know, five days a week or <clears throat> hybrid learning, et cetera. Um, what is going to be the expectation for students in terms of uh, in-person student attendance? Because uh, one of the challenges and frustrations of, of teachers, you know, is just like, do I mark a kid present if they're, you know, on Zoom, or do I mark them absent if they said they were in person? So I think just creating clear guidelines for what we expect of students. Um, obviously, we've all been flexible. Um, I've asked my teachers to be flexible, and I think they have been. Um, you know, but as we go to next year, uh, I think we need to look at where are the expectations. Uh, not only for students, but for teachers um, in this hybrid learning environment and, you know, providing the additional training and support for concurrent learning um, because we have relatively small number of students right now. We are getting some practice with concurrent instruction, um, but I think that, you know, as we go into next year, we don't know what it will look like, but I just think we need to be clear with um, all stakeholders of our expectations uh, for what instruction will look like and try to manage that in a flexible and consistent manner across the school division. Um, and I, you know, we as a cohesive high school group have worked very diligently um, to get guidelines. And I thank Mr. Mulgrew and all of our staff, um, my, my colleagues, um, but I think that's something that needs to be answered. And last, Dr. Groover. I think that the biggest challenge from where I sit um, throughout the year has just been the uncertainty and the changes. Um, that's part of the world we're living in right now and we know that, but that has been very difficult on the teachers um, because they've just had to change so much. Um, you know, the parents being given the option each quarter to decide if they wanted to be in-person or virtual um, at the elementary level, there were times that that meant um, children had to change their classroom teacher, depending if the teacher was tier one and the parent wanted in-person and we couldn't provide that with that teacher. So 
that has been the most challenging part. I feel like we do things and then we do them over and we do them over again and over again. So, um, but we've become good at it and we do it with the best attitude that we can. Well, outstanding. I think that's a great note to finish on. So thank you so much. We truly appreciate that, uh, that discussion this evening. Um, you know, I, I didn't ask any questions, just a, a comment on how incredible a job you all have done, what you guys as principals, our teachers, our staff have done. Um, I have heard nothing but incredibly positive comments from our students, our families who've gone in this week and how excited they've been seen a lot of first day pictures today was the last first day and so it was um, fantastic so thank you all for for making the adjustments and adapting to constant change it's an incredible incredible um, challenge as you all laid out very nicely for us tonight thank you all very much i think we can move on to the pandemic update um, thank you thank you chairman latif uh, again, I'd like to echo my thanks to uh, Dr. Groover, Ms. Mitchell, Dr. Nichols. Um, I know you have an early morning tomorrow. Great job so far. You did an amazing job uh, responding to the board's questions. And I deeply appreciate what you and everyone who works with you in your schools is doing uh, to welcome our students back. Also would like to thank our facilitator, Ms. Jarcelyn Hart and Mr. Provencio, who did the coordination and prep work for tonight. So thank you. And with that, I will now turn it over to Ms. Hebner. Good evening, Chairman Latif, Madam Vice Chair, members of the school board, Dr. Waltz. Tonight it's been mentioned that we are closing in on almost a year since our initial shutdown. During the past year, there's been a great amount of uncertainty, uh, numerous challenges, a little bit of stress, and some constant changes. At times, the roadblocks seemed insurmountable, but our teams at the division and school level have remained focused on the possibilities and worked at solving the problems rather than admiring them. We're thrilled to have more students at every level back in our buildings, and we're grateful for our school teams and their work to prepare for our additional learners. Our school leaders have never worked harder. They have impressed us at every single turn. I'd like to give them a little virtual high five. Throughout this time, we have all kept our students' education and our school family's safety and well-being at the forefront of our decision making. During our presentation tonight, a team for mismanagement will showcase a few of the ways that we are working to implement mitigation strategies in our schools to allow for safe return of our family. Next slide, please. Additionally, we'll look at community transmission as well as a review of the school impact data. We'll look at socially responsible behavior and provide an update on vaccines. At this time, I'll turn the presentation over to Mr. Crow, Director of Risk Management and Security Services for an update on our PPE and school support teams. Next slide, please. Thank you and good evening. Uh, I'll be reporting on the PPE monitoring team's efforts since the last meeting. Uh, schools continue to do an excellent job in impl implementing the CDC's five mitigation strategies. Uh, we've been monitoring schools since December, but I've cleaned up the slide a little bit and have included the last two reviews of risk management has done in early and mid-February, and that's noted by the February and the uh, February 2 uh, number beside it for the second, uh, the second review. All strategies uh, so far have ranked in our lowest risk category. Uh, you'll notice that the two most important strategies as identified by the CDC, which are the correct and consistent use of masks and the physical distancing have been highlighted although all five uh, of the mitigation strategies are important. Next slide, please. For our scoring rubric, we have taken into account the two more important strategies, uh, mask and physical distancing, and weighted them more heavily against the other areas. Uh, those two strategies, as you can see at the bottom, have been noted with a, a, a scoring of eight, and with the other three strategies being scored uh, through four for the, high, for the lowest risk, excuse me. Scoring for the second review in February puts us in the lowest risk category, well, once again. Next slide. As promised, we've included a few slides for mitigation efforts in our schools. Uh, these slides come from Battlefield High School. So as we welcome our uh, you know, staff, extra staff and middle and high school students back, I also wanna welcome back our SROs. 
Um, I know they are excited to get back in the schools and work with our uh, students and staff there. So a few slides from Battlefield. Next slide. Pretty basic um, slides you'll see at the schools. They've uh, um, incorporated their school colors and their uh, logos into uh, some of their signs, which is nice to see. Next slide. And just some hallway uh, directional signs that you'll see. Next slide. And some of the other ones with their school logos that they put down uh, for one-way stairs. And again, uh, uh, directional signs in the hallways and six-foot distancing stickers. Next slide. And we have limits in the elevators and also in the restrooms uh, posted, so people are aware of uh, what they should be doing there. Next slide. And finally, uh, some directional signs for uh, doorways, one way in and one way out. And I think you can see Miss Mills over there hiding in the corner behind her uh, plexiglass while she's uh, working uh, over there. And you can see some of the yellow, or I'm sorry, green striping around the uh, spacing uh, to create some spacing up there at the front of the office or in front of the uh, classroom. And that's all the slides we have uh, for you tonight. I will turn it back over to Ms. Hebner. Last minute we reviewed that the CDC has released new guidance that replaces the CDC's indicators for dynamic school decision making. One of the first steps in the guidance is to encourage us to look at the community data. This slide shows the community transmission data according to the CVC coded data, oh, that's hard to say, CDC COVID data tracker. It's important to remember that this changes from a two-week time frame to a seven-day time frame. You'll see that the metrics are moving in a positive direction, actually positive in that they are lower. The number of new cases has dropped from 304 per 100,000 to 139 as of February 28th. Additionally, the percent of positivity has dropped from 12.13 to 8.14. Next slide, please. You'll recall that the number of categories has changed. The former indicators had five levels of transmission lowest, lower, moderate, higher, and highest. That's been updated to new thresholds, which have four levels of community transmission, which is low, moderate, substantial, and high. On this slide, you'll see where those metrics fall according to the new threshold, placing our positivity in the orange or the substantial level, and high for the number of new cases. Next slide, please. According to the, the COVID data tracker, we fall in the red or the highest transmission, as when the two indicators are not aligned, you go with the highest indicator. The recommendations in the K-12 operational strategy are not intended to require schools to close or to restrict in-person learning for these schools that are already opened, but it's just a guide or a measure to help us look at our mitigation strategies and put in effective mitigation and implementation of additional supports in place. As you saw from the presentation by risk management, our schools are utilizing layered mitigation strategies and working to ensure the safety and well-being of our students. We do require universal masking, and we have planned for the use of space to allow and strive for six feet as the gold standard. Additionally, we've offered our staff vaccines. We acknowledge that vaccines are not a prerequisite, but we are grateful that they provide the additional layer of mitigation. It's important to remember that while in-person instruction is successfully occurring, we maintain a virtual option for students if that is the best choice for that student. Next slide, please. And as you'll recall, again, during the last meeting, I shared that the VDOE and the VDH were working with the Secretary of Health and Education and the Governor's Office to compare the new CDC guidance with the Virginia Interim January guidance that was released. Well, today, the, v the Virginia Department of Health um, published a new update to the CDC metrics dashboard, as seen on this slide. While the dashboard has been updated to reflect the seven-day time frame, the VDOE and the VDH guidance, the interim guidance that was published in January, remains the same. This slide shows the core indicators using the seven-day measure. You'll note that there's a slight discrepancy from the COVID tracker um, on, with the, D, the VDH dashboard slide. This is due to the difference in the date range. The VDA met, VDH metrics end on 227, and the COVID data tracker metrics ended on 228. Next slide, please. This reflects our secondary indicators, which are local and regional data. Regional as in hospital beds are all, always shared throughout the region, rather just a locality. Next slide, please. The overall level of community transmission is shown on this slide. The graph shows the trend since um, the previous February of 2020. While community transmission is an important consideration, the most important data we monitor is related to the impact of COVID in our schools. So at this time, I'll ask Mrs. Schlater to review our school impact data. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mrs. Hebner. Uh, good evening, Chairman Latif, uh, members of the board, and Dr. Waltz. As Mrs. Hebner said, my name is Becca Slater, and I'm proud to serve as the Director of Student Services. This evening, I will share some division pandemic data with the board spanning the time period of February 14th to February 28th. It is important to note that this time period, for the most part, included only those staff members and students who were present for in-person learning for our vulnerable learners and our hybrid students in grades K to 3. As you will see, we have noted decreases in both the number of cases and the number of staff members and students needing to quarantine. This is aligned with the improving metrics that Mrs. Hebner just shared that we are seeing in the community at large. On this slide, you'll see a summary of some of the measures that we analyze frequently to determine the level of school impact. The positive cases for both virtual and in-person students continue to decrease and account for a very small percentage of the entire student population for that learning environment. When looking at our surveillance form data, it's important to understand that surveillance forms are submitted for a variety of reasons, not just illness. You will see here that over one half of the forms submitted during this time period are for those who are close contacts and not necessarily those who are ill. Finally, we closely monitor any situations that may be classified as a school outbreak. A school outbreak is defined as a situation where two or more individuals receive a positive test result on a molecular test, not the rapid test, with the length of the school setting. To date, we have had four school outbreaks reported to the Virginia Department of Health dashboard. We have recently put new processes in place to support schools when we find a situation wherein there may be a cluster of cases. This support includes a visit by our school support team led by Mr. Crow and ongoing collaboration with one of our two pandemic coordinators. Next slide, please. On this slide, you will see data regarding those situations in which students had to quarantine during the period of February 14 to 28. You will note that most of our close contacts are not ill and are being quarantined per CDC guidelines as a precaution. During this time period, it has been reported to us that 180 students have been quarantined. Next slide, please. Here you see our student positive case data broken out by student learning environment. We continue to see the majority of our positive cases are for those students learning virtually. In all situations, the number of positive cases account for two tenths of a percent of the student population or less. Next slide, please. On this slide, you will see data regarding those situations in which staff members had to quarantine during the period of February 14 to 28. Again, you will see most of our close contacts are not ill and are being quarantined per CDC guidelines as a precaution. During this time period, it has been reported to us that 67 staff members have been quarantined. Next slide, please. Finally, you will see our staff member positive case data broken out by work environment. You will see that our in-person staff members are affected by positive cases at a higher rate than our virtual staff members. In all situations, the number of positive cases account for less than four tenths of a percent of the staff member population. I will now turn the presentation over to our supervisor of student health services, the wonderful Mrs. Teresa Polk, um, who will talk about our vaccine. So if we could go to the next slide for Mrs. Polk, thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Slater. Good evening, uh, Chairman Latif, members of the school board and Dr. Waltz. I am happy to provide the information on the update on vaccinations. On this slide, you can see that over 7,000 second doses have been completed. All Prince William County school staff members have been offered the opportunity to receive the first dose of the vaccine. Second dose clinics were held during the month of February from the 19th through the 28th and on March the 1st. Additional second dose clinics for Prince William County school employees will take place on March 7th, 8th, 14th, and 15th. After the uh, clinic that was held on March the 1st, 
Uh, the uh, Novant Clinic has been moved now from Unity Reed High School to the Kelly Leadership Center. Prince William County Schools has partnered with Novant UVA to provide clinics for Manassas City and Manassas Park Schools, as well as thousands of eligible community members. And I must take this opportunity to give a shout out and kudos to the Prince William County School nurses who have consistently worked the vaccine clinics since the first day they began. They have been working tirelessly to ensure that they are able to support not only our staff, but the community members as well. Next slide, please. This slide shares uh, information about the vSafe uh, smartphone device tool. And this is an after vaccination health checker. It is a uh, smartphone based tool that uses text messaging and web surveys to provide personalized health check-ins after you receive a COVID-19 vaccine. So if you have already received your first vaccine you pro and have downloaded this, you probably have received these messages and basically they're just checking in to find out if, what side effects that you may have had. And you'll get reminders as well about your second dose so it is a very uh, nice thing that is occurring. And I know I have personally provided information after receiving my first and second vaccine. And so all you have to do is go through the registration process to vsafe.cdc.gov to uh, register and get this particular health checker. Next slide, please. And with, through collaboration with the Prince William Health District, you can also download COVID-Wise. And this is an app that you can download through the App Store or Google Play. And it is Virginia's official exposure notification that lets you know if you've likely been exposed to another COVID-wide user with a positive COVID-19 test result. It is a free download to your smartphone and is designed to completely protect your privacy. Of course, it says the more Virginians that use COVID-wise, the better you can be informed of potential exposure, which helps reduce your risk while protecting your family, friends, and community. COVID-wise is now connected to the national key server, which lets COVID-wise anonymously share data with exposure notifications apps from other states. This concludes my part of the presentation, and we will now turn it back over to Mrs. Heatner. Thank you. We'd just like to take one more opportunity to thank the staff at Unity Reed for the use of their building and the support from their team, the custodians, the PE staff, um, the DSA, the teachers who allowed us to use their space. We're very grateful. Dr. Nichols and his staff, including these two amazing gentlemen, Mr. Barton and Mr. Bouchard, went above and beyond at all times. I'm grateful for the work that they've done and for the new friendships that we formed. I feel we are now bonded for life through these vaccine clinics. <laughs> so you know, as we've heard during our meetings and through our conversations with stakeholders, um, you know, it's clear to me that there is much healing to be done. While the vaccine is not the only answer, it is one step toward a brighter future. Next slide, please. In my personal and my professional life, I strive to see the good in each day. And sometimes during COVID, that has been a challenge. The teamwork and the collaboration of all during this time has definitely been a bright and shining spot. I look forward to the day when the pandemic is over. I mean, I really look forward to the day the pandemic is over. But I encourage us all um, to continue to find the joy in each day. I ask that we give each other's grace and those who need the grace, um, and also engage in some self-care so that we can all continue to do the important work that we need to do. We can't get back the experiences and the time that COVID has altered, so we can work to see the possibilities of the future and maintain our commitment to placing education as a priority. Our team continues to work to refine their processes and to create additional supports for our staff and our students. I know that many of you feel the effects of these unusual times. So I encourage you that if you need assistance, please reach out to a teacher, a counselor, a colleague, a trusted individual. Reach out to me, I'll help you. Um, we have numerous resources available on our website and our counselors and our social workers stand ready to help you. Thank you to my colleagues for their support, our health leadership team for their dedication and hard work and to our in-person and to our virtual educators for making great things happen for our kids. It's important that we remain vigilant and honoring the recommendations of the health district. That is the only way that COVID is going to end. Please follow the guidelines in order to reduce the COVID spread inside and outside of our school buildings. And this concludes our presentation tonight. Thank you.
So thank you very much, Ms. Hebner. I also want to thank your entire team and specifically those who helped you tonight, Mr. Crow, Ms. Schlater, Ms. Polk. Uh, you folks do a great job of analyzing all this data and trying to present it in a way uh, that people can understand it and behind the scenes and sometimes presenting as well, Ms. Bellamy, um, Ms. Wines, Ms. Sharma, Mr. Wallingford, uh, everyone who contributes to this, it's very much appreciated and thank you so much. And with that, I will turn it back to Chairman Latif and the board. Thank you so much, thank you so much. And, and Ms. Hebner, I, I, don't, I think the entire county, the entire school division, the entire staff owes you a, great, a debt of gratitude for the incredible work you, your team have led and, and, and it can't be said too much. So thank you very much. Um, okay, we'll move on next to the adoption Dr. of a resolution. Dr. Latif? Yes. I do have one question for Dr. Waltz. Yes, Ms. Jessica. Okay. Uh, a couple of questions. On, I, I know that we always present things in a positive light and slide 17, it seems that there's always this point two, it's only point seven, uh, 52 percent of the surveillance forms, they were not ill, but 48 percent were. If when you're presenting, um, I, I'm just asking you to consider uh, not using the decimals because these are people. And I'd ask you to present also the fact that we did have people who were ill. And uh, Dr. Waltz, um, we had a cafeteria worker who passed away. And the last time we had the custodian pass away, we had a picture of her and we talked about her. Uh, can you provide us with more insights into that individual or if not now, maybe at a later date? Yes, yeah, so uh, we, we I didn't, mentioned her I don't tonight, gave, but I, I had don't think spoken we gave about her. As her. Much at the last meeting, but I'm, I'm happy to do so again. And as I mentioned earlier, I went out um, we had a to Woodbridge Middle and School family. So, okay. so I could meet with the entire uh, food service group and uh, the principal and, and also the custodians, because as you know, from being a, a principal, that's a tight knit group, uh, especially in an elementary school. And Flora Cervantes was kind of the, uh, the, the center, the heartbeat of that group. She had a very vivacious and outgoing personality. And I felt, uh, I felt the need to go out there and visit with them personally this week. And uh, that was very difficult. There was a, a lot of weeping, um, but we talked about it and I learned some things about her and um, COVID ravaged that, uh, several members of that family, but she was a strong influence out there and she came about the same time uh, as the principal. So she, she had been there almost five years and uh, she was also well known to students and faculty members. And I had a couple of faculty members reach out to me and talk about that they interacted with Floor almost on a daily basis. And again, a great personality and um, you are absolutely right. These, uh, these numbers all represent people and we can certainly look at the way we present the data. I don't put that data together. I, I think the health department does, but we can see what we can do about making, uh, making some of that into just whole numbers and, uh, and see if we can make that happen for, the, for next time. Okay, I'm just as, asking you to adjust the presentation, our presentation mode. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Ms. Jackson. And, and thank you, Dr. Waltz, for listing the um, hotline number today and the email for reporting concerns. I just had a follow-up question. I actually have two. One is when they uh, go to schools to inspect the schools for um, you know, the mitigation strategies, do they talk to the teachers to gather anecdotal, anecdotal data? I, I would like to ask um, Mr. Crow if he could respond, please. I think, I think he stepped out. Do you want me to ask the other question? Then? Sure. Mr. Crow stepped out, so we'll have her ask you the next question. <laughs> sure. 
I just wanted to, I, I um, thank you again for answering the questions before the meetings. It does help streamline. I have a follow-up on my question about the Alphabest and um, that there's, the response was no update has been provided uh, because Prince William County Schools is unfortunately unable to provide additional offerings through Alphabest. I know a number of teachers that are still struggling with daycare. Is it possible? And I know there's a wait list. Is it, if the wait list were to continue, is it possible to open more Alphabest or like what other opportunities are we looking into? Yes, and we have uh, a person on staff, uh, Ms. Glennis Taylor, who uh, works directly with them. I think the teacher uh, who spoke earlier, and again, I try to be very careful because when people come up before the board at Citizens Time, we, we wanna make sure that, that they feel, um, you know, comfortable in saying whatever they want to say. But I think what she was referring to, oh, I only know this because we've been researching this uh, since since uh, she spoke, when COVID first hit, there were a number of reductions in the programs, like schools that had to close. We had difficulty, and as you know, we've partnered with the county, and the money has flowed through the county to help subsidize and provide scholarships. So we are still working closely with the county. And we're trying to look at some of our numbers and see what we can do to perhaps expand and, and expand this scholarship program, which we still have money in it. We're still offering the scholarships. But uh, to the teacher's point, if, if you don't have room in the school where you're hoping to have it, we need to see if we can do a satellite school nearby. And it's my understanding, again, between the time she's spoken now, um, that those talks are continuing um, with some sense of urgency around seeing what we can do to reopen uh, some additional sites or to expand uh, perhaps into another classroom next door or something like that to take in some additional students. So we are aware of it, we are working with it, and we are working directly with the county on doing it. And hopefully there'll be a public announcement, a, a joint announcement um, within the next week or so about expanding. Okay, thank you. That sounds like um, an update to what I was provided and that there will be more information coming. Yes. So I appreciate that. Thank you. And Okay, Ms. Wall. I have a clarifying question on that. Ms. Williams. Thank you. Could we also look into Alphabest, what policies or procedures that they have or what, what uh, I know we don't have authority over them because we contract with them. Um, regarding like the sudden closures that are outside of, um, you know, weather, inclement weather, just, just to help our staff who do utilize them and the public who do utilize them. Maybe they need a, um, an update on that because it sounded like from um, the teacher who spoke this evening that it was a sudden closure at a site. And um, I know as a, as a parent that could be very challenging and, and I think that was more the issue than not necessarily having enough seats, but I know that that is also a very important issue. So um, I was just wondering if we could get a little update on that or maybe have it sent to our parents. I will make sure that we send some information uh, out to the board. Thank you. And then Mr. Crow is back. Um, Dr. Waltz, did you want to direct Mr. Crow on the question or what was the question yes, that you Ms. wanted Jackson, to Yes, Ms. Jackson, if you wouldn't mind repeating that question, please. And Mr. Crow will uh, be happy to answer it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Crow. Um, my sure. question was just a follow-up. When you attend the schools to you know, review mitigation strategies and the rubric that was listed, do you speak with individual teachers separately to gather anecdotal data? We do. When we walk around, um, a lot of times it's with the administrators in the school building. Um, when we go into classrooms, we, we do the best we can not to interrupt instruction, but uh, we do seek out to talk to them and uh, um, see if they have everything that they need. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Great, Ms. Wall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to commend um, Dr. Hebner and Dr. Eagle and Mr. Crow and um, Nurse Polk and Unity Read uh, team, the nurses team, the PWCS volunteer team. Um, I've been to many of these clinics to kind of step in and I just want to say thank you. I think what you have pulled off is amazing. Um, what you're going to continue to do is going to be amazing. Um, you know, partnering with our neighboring school divisions is 
really commendable. We've done a great job in PWCS, and now we're going to spread that love. <laughs> um, and I, I really think that's tremendous, and also extending to the community as well. Um, that's going to make a big difference. That has made a big difference. And I know a lot of people have told me how thankful they are and how impressed they were by what we were able to do with that partnership with Novant Health UVA. So I just wanted to say thank you. And in my um, visits to the schools in my district, I can attest to what I have seen, to what Mr. Crow has said, you know, the mitigation strategies that there is, at least from what I can tell and what I've found, is there's consistent compliance. And um, I want to commend the students. Um, we've talked a lot about about um, teachers tonight, but I want to commend the students on their cooperation with all of the many differences and new ways of doing things that we've asked them to do and to kind of cooperate with. They've done a really great job of being flexible and being understanding um, of what we've asked them to do. Um, and this health report, I know, you know, putting together these charts, collecting this data, you know, putting in these details for us takes a lot of time. And I really appreciate the effort that has gone into you know, giving us these health updates and, and everything else. You, you guys have been, your team has just been amazing and I just wanted to say thank you. It gives us a good level of transparency um, for the community to see and to understand you know, how many people are we quarantining, how many people are sick. Um, you know, the point, um, the two tenths of percent is a significant number, the seven hundredths of a percent is a significant number. That's really good for our community to see and I think it helps us all be on the same page as far as understanding the impact of COVID in our schools. And that hopefully will generate confidence and um, a, a level of uh, commonality in our understanding of where we go from here. So I just wanted to say thank you. Okay, great. I, I think we should just add that, you know, a number of our school board members volunteered in the Unity Read clinics. Uh, Jen Wall was there. Um, almost like a, a pillar in the building most of the time. Ms. Zargapur and Mr. Wilk, um, I think it should be noted that um, spent a lot of time there. And I'd also like to personally thank the CEO of um, Navan Hospital, Al Pylong, who during the snow days came in himself and volunteered um, at different aspects of the clinic. So it was really an all hands on deck operation. And um, it continues, um, as Dr. Waltz pointed out, here in the Kelly Building. So we got still some more clinics to go and some more folks to vaccinate to finish up. Thank you all. Uh, we'll move on next to the um, um, next item on the agenda is the adoption of the resolution supporting a vaccine for all Prince William County staff. Um, I do, does anybody wanna read this or do you want me to make this motion? It has my name. Okay, so I'll, I'll um, oh, how about Ms. Wall? Ms. Wall, why don't you read that? I will volunteer to read it. <laughs> Resolution urging all PWCS employees to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, whereas on January 6, 2021, the Prince William County School Board adopted a resolution to request that the governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia prioritize the vaccination of school personnel in order to ensure that students and staff of the Prince William County Public Schools are able to return to our school buildings as soon as feasible and with minimal risk during the COVID-19 pandemic. And whereas, as of January 11, 2021, PWCS teachers became eligible to receive vaccinations, which have proven effective in combating COVID-19, and which began to be administered at no cost on January 17, 2021, and which continue to be made available to PWCS employees. And whereas, as of February 14, 2021, over 10,400 teachers and other PWCS employees have received the vaccine, and additional vaccine opportunities are expected to be available over the upcoming weeks and months. And whereas on February 5th, 2021, the governor issued a letter to all Virginia school boards and superintendents concerning his expectation that to prevent irreparable learning loss and psychological damage to all students, to students, all school divisions in the Commonwealth should make in-person learning options available by March 15th, 2021, in accordance with the Virginia Department of Education's January 14th, 2021 updated interim guidance for reopening pre-K tw through 12 schools. And whereas the Prince William County School Board has already provided in-person learning to pre-K and first through third grade students and approved an updated plan on February 17, 2021 to return additional students to in-person learning beginning February 25th, 2021, which plan will require an increasing number of PWCS teachers, administrators, and support staff 
to return to work in PWCS schools, offices, and other facilities, and whose physical presence is essential to the operations of the division and delivery of instruction. And whereas the education of students and the safety of students and staff is of paramount importance to the school board, be it hereby resolved that Prince William County School Board encourages all PWCS employees who are able to do so to promptly receive the COVID-19 vaccine as it is made available to them in order to facilitate the provision of in-person learning to PWCS students whose education continues to be adversely impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic and resultant closure of schools. So Mr. Chairman, I move to adopt this resolution as just read. Do you have a second? Mr. Chairman? Ms. Williams. Oh, second. And we have a second. Any discussion? Ms. Williams? So I second this motion because I think it is important to discuss this resolution. I personally will not be supporting this resolution. I feel that this is a school board. Um, it, it tells our staff, um, it, it's, it's like a bully move. We have bent over backwards to provide access to the vaccination for our staff at this point, or at least at our last meeting. Um, at least 10,400 of our staff members had been provided with a COVID-19 vaccination. I don't like the section in uh, the resolution where it talks about February 5th, the governor's issued a letter. It sort of frames it in a way to say that this was pertinent to us offering in-person learning when Prince William County Schools had been offering in-person learning and we were one of the only school divisions in Northern Virginia to do so since day one. Um, I also don't like the last section where it says employees are who are able to do so. It doesn't give any credence to pe people's own personal opinions, how they feel about a vaccine in the medical community, their cultures and respect um, with respect to that. Um, and uh, it, vaccines aren't required for us to even open. So at this point, it's, it's sort of sort of a technical option. I mean, we would like our employees to get vaccinated because it, it benefits us as a school division um, when it comes to quarantining and things of that nature, but it's not a requirement. I know that there's still chatter amongst the legal community whether employees are required to mandate their employer, and um, employers are required to mandate their employees to get a vaccine or not, but that discussion hasn't been finalized. And I just feel as a division, we've offered it. And to add a resolution to that, I think is offensive to those who, um, don't feel comfortable getting a vaccine for whatever reason, whether it's personal, scientific, cultural, whatever reason. And um, I do like the acknowledgement part for those who are able to do so, because there's some that may want to, but just can't right now for whatever reason. But I just can't support it for that reasons. Okay, please vote. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams, or um, I'm sorry, Ms. Jesse. Did you call on me? Ms. Jessie. I'm sorry. Um, I'm not sure why we need the resolution. I, I, I personally just don't like the last part because it implies to me that uh, if you're able to do so, some people are not taking the vaccine for religious reasons. It, it just seems that we are saying to employees that uh, we're kind of gently reminding them that we, were, we want them to take the vaccine and those people who don't, uh, we're having problems with that. And so for that reason, I cannot support this resolution. I do like uh, where we've outlined what we've done as a division because I think the 10,000 uh, vaccines that were given and the effort put into that was tremendous, but I'm not sure why do we need a resolution to outline what we've done and to prompt people to take the vaccine. I would think that by now most people know that they need to take the vaccine. And I on honestly don't know the legal ram ramifications for individuals who choose not to take the, the vaccine. Will those people, those individuals have to justify why they're not? I just think that this resolution is something that is not necessarily needed. And the hereby I resolve portion of the resolution I do not agree with. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Jackson. Um, I would like to echo the sentiments of the uh, previous board members, but while I do agree with contents of this um, resolution, and I do believe that encouraging staff is you know, an important part of this, but I, I do understand that people should have a choice, and um, I support um, what they have said, and I'm not gonna be supporting this resolution. Thank you. Okay, please vote. Ms. Ralston, how do you vote? No.
on the computer, didn't you? So the vote is three yes, Dr. Latif, Mrs. Wall, Mrs. Zargarpur, five no, Mrs. Jackson, Mrs. Jesse, Ms. Ralston, Mr. Wilk, and Ms. Williams. Motion failed. Moving on to leading with an equity lens. We have a presentation. Dr. Waltz. My understanding, uh, I'll defer to the deputy, but it was my understanding this was uh, something that Ms. Williams was presenting. The, the presentation we're doing is at a future meeting, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, thank you, Dr. Waltz, that is correct. Uh, this presentation is in response to Ms. Williams' request, and Ms. Burgos is with us tonight uh, to make that presentation. Ms. Williams, do you have any introductory comments? Um, thank you, Mr. Iman. I appreciate the um, division putting together this presentation. I think we did need a little bit more clarification on what it meant to look through um, our practices and policies um, uh, and values through a lens of equity instead of just looking at that term generically. I also, while I have the uh, opportunity, I would like to thank Maria Burgos for making this presentation tonight and um, formally say our goodbye to her um, from the board because she has left us and will be starting a new position with Prince William County government as an equity officer there and I want to offer her congratulations and thank you again for bearing with us for one more night it is our loss but the county's gain and I'm sure we will continue to collaborate in the future so thank you Ms. Burgos thank you I just need the um, shared screen I guess so I can Let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't need to share a screen. It's, it's up here. Please forgive me. Um, let's see. Let me escape from here. My apologies. Good evening, Chairman at Large, Dr. Latif, and members of the board, and Dr. Walls. I am Maria Burgos and serve as the new Prince William County Equity and Inclusion Officer in the Office of Executive Management as of Monday, March 1st. This evening, I will provide an overview of the division's educational equity framework entitled Leading with an Equity Lens, Upholding Equitable Policies, Practices, Programs, and Democratic Values. As a division, multicultural education was established in the mid-90s, and all schools participated in multicultural education and year-end division conferences. Professional learning in the areas of multicultural competency and culturally responsive instruction was introduced in 2013. Many schools and individual employees participated in recursive professional learning. In 2017, the Prince William County Board and Superintendent of Schools adopted a systemic approach and mandated recursive cultural competency training for all schools and center office employees supporting learning. To grow leadership capacity, culturally aware and responsive educator leads from each school were trained to provide ongoing turnkey professional learning to all schools. As next steps, this educational framework was adopted by the superintendent staff in August of 2020 to center equitable practice systemically in all functions of the division as an essential next step to ensure safe, responsive, and inclusive working and learning environments. Centering an equity lens, oh, next. Thank you. Century and Equity Lens is an education at heart, is at the heart of Prince William County Schools and the Virginia Department of Education. Educational equity is a collaborative commitment to action through the process of distributing access and opportunity. Next slide. In June, 18, on June 18, 2020, the Virginia Board of Education voted unanimously to address systemic racism and racial justice in education. For the entire statement from the Virginia Board of Education, you can visit, visit the VDOE website. Next. 
In the in introduction to Navigating at Equity Virginia Roadmap, Dr. James Lane wrote a Dear Virginia Educator letter noting that education leaders now more than ever are called upon to affirm our commitment to advancing equity in Virginia public schools and facilitating courageous conversations on social justice, systemic inequity, disparate student outcomes and racism in our school communities is absolutely our responsibility and professional obligation. Next slide, please. To be culturally competent is to understand the dynamics of cultural identity as a lived experience. To be culturally competent is to understand the importance of reflection and self-awareness of who we are and the dimensions of our identities as an ongoing practice. To be culturally competent is to be continuously seeking to understand perspectives and worldviews of others. To be culturally competent is to understand the systems of oppression, recognize, respond to, and readdress any subtle forms of bias, discrimination, and, and inequity to sustain a bias-free and discrimination-free working and learning environment. Next slide. Equity is not a program and cannot happen in a vacuum. It really must be moving into everyday practice at every level of the division um, and every level of the county, really. Cultural competency and action centers equity practices in all aspects of the division. Equity accountability targets provide continuous improvement, perspective, and strengthen programs, policy, and procedures to ensure equity and inclusivity in all that we do. For that, there are a few areas of recommendation and do your uh, um, uh, superintendent advisory council on equity will collaborate with VDOE and other educational resources to review and make recommendations on accountability targets and indicators to the division equity lens. Some of these targets include, as examples, funding allocations that are both flexible and transparent and are based on the needs of its students with additional financial resources that are allocated to schools and department to support students with higher needs. Learning facilities are structurally sound, have access to resources, technology, effective equipment to support academic achievement and social development. The third target is inclusive climates, which are physically and emotionally safe environments with a diverse workforce as visual representations of success and leadership. Courageous leadership enacts a continual process of learning, disaggregating data, questioning assumptions about equity relevance and its effectiveness of practice with a focus that is intentional and strategic within the vision, families, and external partners. Courageous teachers' practices are rigorous, engaging, culturally relevant, standards aligned with the Virginia Five key skills. And the last of the targets would be culturally responsive instruction. The Department of Education is currently building these targets um, and in alignment with, with the um, with, with VDOE, this will build the capacity of Prince William County staff to maximize student achievement, social development, and eliminate opportunity gaps and exclusionary practices. Next slide. Leading with an equity lens calls for collaboration, ongoing analysis, and input from all its stakeholders on a continuum. It utilizes metrics to ensure equitable policies, metrics that have not been introduced um, really across the board in the Commonwealth, but will really help us look at our equ equitable policies, practices, programs, and ideologies, and how they're interrelated and inform one another. Um, it assures equity of financial, human, and instructional resources re resulting in a world-class education that prepares every child as stewards of self, as stewards of community, and stewards of this world. Next slide. To enact a systemic change, There are five dimensions of consideration and educational equity to consider in this journey. And know that um, we're talking about changing culture that's been in existence since we opened our doors in education. So to build that systemic change, we must be very transparent about what we do and how we report it to the public, to all of our stakeholders, and to our division employees. We must go through the theory of change, which we'll look at in a minute, collaborate, like, collaborate continuously, 
lead with an equity lens of leadership and accountability where goals are identified, anticipated outcomes are identified, means of data gathering are identified, evaluation plans include system, office, and school level analysis. Next slide. How transparency is addressed is by consistently um, addressing objectives, the understandings around those objectives, and providing enriching and engaging content with anticipated outcomes, knowing your audience, and using solid research and theory applications. Next slide. The theory of change is uh, really uh, an essential process. And looking at a practice that we have not had in the Commonwealth, and that is the understanding around these structures, we must really engage um, and build a community, uh, a community of trust, a community of understanding. And to do that, we must engender awareness. And this is done in process called leveling. While you're doing that, you're also constructing knowledge uh, with practitioners, with students, with parents, uh, within departments. And then as you proceed within these levels, you apply advanced applications. Next, next slide, please. Of course, this work has to be done with partnerships as best practices. And to this day, uh, many, many folks have been part of really engaging and, um, and building this framework. That includes uh, culturally responsive curriculum special specialists from the Office of Professional Learning, care leads, and they are representatives from every school, parent and community leaders, the Virginia Department of Education, equity consultants, and region for equity chiefs, supervisors, and coordinators. Our consultant partnerships include Leah Walker. She is the Virginia, Direct, uh, Virginia Department of Education Director of Equity and Community Engagement. Dr. Lisa um, Williams, who's the founder of EMCS, uh, and she's still collaborating uh, with the division. Dr. Micah Polak, she is the director for the Center of Research and Educational Equity, Assessment and Teaching Excellent called CREATE at the University of San Diego. And Dr. Paul Gorski, the founder of Equity Literacy Institute and Edit Change. Next slide, please. Um, this work, um, of changing culture and bringing in equity and inclusivity with a new lens and approach is aligned to the state. That means that um, what we're doing is across the Commonwealth, um, is setting the precedence in the nation of um, how school systems perform, how school systems conduct, and it really works with lots of collaboration. So uh, just to thank um, all the folks that are listed here for the work that they're doing and will continue to work, and those are school administrators and care leads who have been at the heart of this work uh, since the very beginning, the Department of Accountability, the Department of Special Education and Student Services, the Department of Student and Professional Learning, the Department of Human Resources, the Superintendent's Advisory Council on Equity, Equity and Compliance, and Risk Management. So what does it look like, this continuum of school equity? It first looks at leveling engagement that allows continuous growth to engage in learning and practice. It does support the theory of change. It blends with the following bodies of research, internal consistency with research related to cultural proficiency and internal consistency with research related to anti-racist schooling practices. And all of these, again, are aligned with uh, the Virginia Department of Education. Level one is uh, onboarding and it builds an understanding of, of equity literacy. It instills transformative equity approach to dismantle all forms of inequity. Level two is pre-confidence and has a growing understanding and commitment to dismantling institutional racism. Level three, competency focuses on cultural knowledge and to the extent in which schools examine and address institutional racism. And level four, proficiency examines equity-focused schools and departments as models of inclusivity who recognize value and empower contributions from all stakeholders and have addressed systems of oppression. I know that at the state level, one of the things that they're considering is um, the School of Excellence Award that will be centered around um, equity schools 
tools and schools of model. The other is, um, and actually is in, in the midst of being created now, and it was legisl legislation that was passed, is um, criteria of cultural competency for all school educators every two years to keep current in these matters, as well as the evaluation process for educators and um, educational leaders. We are currently training um, and have trained over 145 culturally aware and responsive care lead educators who will facilitate professional training. Training of this level requires thoughtful application to ensure we make space and opportunity to access experience through multiple identity perspectives. Racial perspectives being one important identity in a manner that is more likely to increase our ability to interrupt discourse, which derails full participation. Level one begins with online uh, self-paced coursework with the Equity Literacy Institute. Um, in it, it has an understanding of equity and an inequity. Participants will examine common equity literacy definitions and explore the transformative approach. This is online, once again, at their pace, is one of the first things that we'll be embarking on. This will build a founda foundation of knowledge and common vocabularies. Um, the next will be learning to be a threat to, in, uh, to inequity. This is an introduction to the equity literacy uh, component, and here they will explore core aspects, um, framing the equity literacy framework and what is called the 11 dimensions of school functions around abilities and principles that are all related to uh, equity in schools. The last is racial equity and equity literacy, informing ourselves, transforming our schools. This builds the skills and capacities to explore racial equity concepts, practice racial equity skills, examine racial equity principles, and apply racial e equity to 11 aspects of school culture for all school and central office administrator. This is essential because one of the things that is being discussed at the Virginia Department of Education is that when complaints of racism are filed, that those who are handling um, those complaints and making decisions should be well informed in what racism is. Um, Next, next slide, please. Here's a quick look at level one. This is the suggested pacing guide. This has been in conversation with all the care leads and that includes principals as well. These are um, the modules that are being trained in terms of facilitation. They will roll, up, roll out in the fall with all of our staff. It is very critical to build the capacities of care leads because these conversations um, have not been had, and we want to make sure that they are prepared, knowledgeable, and confident about the work that they are doing as trainers. Um, this work has been done in collaboration with um, uh, consultant Dr. Lisa Williams, as well as uh, joint um, collaboration with the care leads who provide excellent feedback. Uh, the, the models that you see here, uh, we're in the process of, of training module one and two. Those have been done and upcoming in the next month will be module one and three. And that is so that they will be ready to roll these out in the fall and um, continued, continued development in the areas these have been developed, but continued development of training and module 1.5 and 1.6. This will be in con collaboration with the consultant. Uh, we have created as part of the transition plan uh, with Rita Goss and uh, Christy Taylor, uh, myself, and um, what we now have care lead chairs. And these are um, folks who've been doing this for quite a while with us and are excellent leaders and facilitators. And they will be, they have been empowered. And I, I tell you, I can't speak enough about them, but they will be providing training for our care leads and these existing modules 1.3 through 1.6 so that um, the division is ready to go. Um, here's a little look at the Equity Literacy Institute self-paced guideline on courses, the amount of hours that each of them take, the completion suggestion dates, as you can see, we're mindful of COVID and we're mindful of the many things as you spoke about tonight, uh, the schools are um, 
balancing and equity being one of them. So in identification of the pace, we included lots of feedback and um, the dates that you see here for participants, uh, all teachers should complete the first part by October 1 of the fall of 2021. And the care leads, of course, because they are preparing, should be uh, to have them completed the month before of September 1st. The second portion of that to be completed by teachers March 1 of 2022 and our care leads to have that completed before November 1 of 2021. And um, because of the compliance and understanding of um, understanding racism, um, September 1 is the date of completion for all care leads, school, administ school administrators, and identify central office employees. This concludes a uh, review of the framework. Thank you for your time. Okay, great. Questions? Ms. Jackson. Thank you for the presentation. That was very informative. Thank you. I just have a quick question. How are the response care lead ed educators selected at schools? Do you know? Yes, I do. Actually, um, there's a, a protocol criteria. We'll, um, Christy Taylor will be happy to share that with you. But there is a criteria. Um, uh, that was set out ahead of time. Uh, they reviewed the criteria. They committed that they were um, willing, wanting to, and able to take on uh, this charge. And um, so that criteria is really based around best practices as facilitators in the, in the area of, of conversations around race and equity. Hey, thank you. And I would like to note also that many of the schools are now working in teams, especially the high schools. They're working in teams uh, where uh, while one care lead may come or principal or administrator may come, they have a turnkey and work with department chairs. So um, I, I think that is just excellent progress in, in, in the right direction. Uh, this work is intensive and it requires its focus. And um, definitely kudos to the schools who have been doing phenomenal work in um, receiving the training, asking excellent questions. And then later this spring, they will be practicing the sessions before they roll them out in the fall. Thank you, Ms. Bargos. Um, I really appreciate, again, you taking the time to come back to us to make this presentation to the board. Um, Again, our loss that we no longer have you with us. Um, but I'm wondering where, where, in your opinion, would you say um, Prince William County Schools is on this continuum of um, school equity versus other divisions within the state? Because I know that you've also worked at the state level. Um, how do we sort of compare, if you can, with some other divisions? Are, are we on pace? Are we behind? Do we have a tremendous amount of work to do? Prince William is definitely not behind. Um, as a matter of fact, um, we're in a good place right now because we have had prior um, uh, prior trainings, prior awareness, uh, and prior practices. So uh, since 2017, systemically, the division participated in modules where concepts around understanding microaggressions, implicit biases, stereotype framing that occurs in the classroom um, have all taken place. And which each one of these, they come with informed strategies to implement. When, you, when we're thinking about the, these next phases. We're talking about that the first part, when we look at the culture of centering equity, is really educating um, your staff so that whether they are working in the Department of Budget, the Department of Transportation, or in schools, that they understand why. And they're building an equity-minded lens. So as we implement tools like equity impact tools, uh, and put those things in place. As we look at um, relative risk ratio as another metric for analyzing data, and as we uh, center conversations with common vocabularies, I can honestly say that Prince William County has a lot to be, be proud of because we're right there, and in many cases, leading the Commonwealth. 
Thank you, Ms. Vargas. Um, I, I have a follow-up question on that. Um, so one of the things that the general public I don't, I don't think is very f as familiar or knowledgeable about this topic, could you explain sort of in um, very layman's terms why it's important to have care leads and the type of work that this is, and it's not, and it's more than just, um, you know, t uh, watch a PowerPoint and sign off, but why this is important in our schools um, and the effect it has on our students' education. And you said in simple layman's terms. Well, as best um, as you can do. I know you're, it, it's hard when, <laughs> when you live and breathe in and this is your life's work, but. Um, no, no, but we, hey, it doesn't do any good if we can't break it down, right? Right. So the, the, the two concepts that I always come across is really um, where education is so powerful because it clears up an understanding of what racism is. Because ideally, most people believe, uh, see and understand racism through a interpersonal lens of racism. In other words, um, they feel, well, I don't enact personal racial beliefs towards others. Um, I treat everybody fairly, I treat everyone in kind, and therefore this is the most common understanding of racism in our country. It, it is it's actually a symptom of more fundamental system of racism. So because you don't participate in direct acts, um, then most people say, therefore, why are we spending our time doing this? But the, the, the work really is around under, understanding ourselves, but then moving, shifting towards institution, how it manifests in institution and structurally in schools. And this is not only Prince William, but across the United States, this is globally. And so when we look at that, we look at the cumulative effects of biases and the compounding effects of societal factors, including the history, the culture, the ideologies of institutions um, that has systemically um, played a role of advantage and disadvantages um, and disadvantages for people of color. And to be able to look at that more systemically, um, I encourage folks to look at um, an article by the New York Times that physically puts the faces of power in all aspects of living so that you can see um, it by gender and race. Um, and that's really what we're going into understanding is understanding these structures and education. Why? Uh, to your question is because when a child does not feel 100% inclusive, whether he or she recognizes it or not, it impacts centers of the brain that delay optimal states of learning. In some cases where a child feels disengaged, disfranchised, and excluded, it will start playing a role in those executive functions in the brain. And the brain loves pattern. So it can create a, um, a dynamics of thinking I'm under a threat and operate under a threat subconsciously on a continuum. So when you add that up over years and years and years of being in this auto response, it could have detrimental effects that have been um, documented in many, many research studies. And so for us, as we are building these conscious states of mind and higher practices of learning, one of the things that we have in Prince William County that we have uh, are leading the pack in is that we spent quite a bit of time looking at what creates optimal states of learning. And so today, at the school board, you heard many principals, you've seen commercials on, on, on representations of mindful practice, because when you are um, infusing mindful practice, you are thinking about your thinking, and you're thinking, do I have enough data to enact what I'm about to enact. That's an equity tool. It, you are thinking about your emotional states of mind and you're putting practices in place to reduce, recenter, and re-engage in learning. So that's part of our framework and the division is also about building the social and emotional skill sets because to be civically minded, you have to have a social smarts. And one thing that we know about science is if you don't purposely build it, 
there's only six to seven that occur on their own when there's a spectrum of about 25 emotions in the human experience that actually give way to deeper learning and to uh, social consciousness. And so at the state level, those are must do's that um, they're really centering on the skills of social and emotional growth, uh, mindful practice for civic engagement, and also to reduce those states of, um, of fear and to recenter. And then of course, cultural competency. Um, and none of this can be done without constantly including our stakeholders, our communities, and our parents in the process. And so I hope I answered uh, your question. Uh, I would, um, um, March 9th at the Department of Education, I will be doing a webinar on that framework and really speaking more intently and giving examples of how teachers can take these practices and put them in place right away. And I will be speaking to all the spokes on that culturally responsive wheel. Thank you, Ms. Burgos. Um, and I really appreciate you tying the, this work into what is required by, by state, what is coming, the expectation that's coming down from the state of Virginia, um, and you know, just highlighting where we are as a division and really explaining um, how this is not work that exists in a vacuum or a silo, um, but it's all of our responsibilities at every level. So I appreciate that. And the last thing that I have to ask is, is not a question you can answer, but I would just like continuous update from the division, like where we stand in this, what our progress is. Um, if we could just every so often get an update on um, the, you know, the progress of this as for our staff, where we stand, um, and, and a little bit more about the institutional knowledge and the transfer um, now that we have this vacancy uh, left by Ms. Bargos and knowing how important this work is and the mandates and requirements that are coming down at the state level for us, I just um, would like to keep this at the, one of the topics of the forefront of importance for this board, especially considering um, we did resolve to have equity as one of our um, focuses. So thank you again and I appreciate your time. Board Member Williams, if I may add, I will continue to be working at the state level on these issues because I'm a member of uh, the Cultural Competency, Culturally Responsive uh, Committee. And also one of the things in this new role is really supporting schools on these initiatives and us uniting as one Prince William. So, um, you know, I'm only down the road and um, my passion uh, is education. And I saw this as, a, uh, as an opportunity to be cohesive, right, in the work so that the Prince William County Schools has been very intentional about creating this systemic approach and Prince William Co County government is intentional too. And so bringing the two together, that's good stuff for our residents in Prince William County. So thank you for today. Dr. Lateef, may I ask? Ms. Jesse. Uh, <clears throat> First of all, Maria, you know, I followed your work and we've worked together. I hope you guys can hear me. My mask is kind of uh, muddling everything over here. But, um, and I've been around for a while. So um, is, is this whole lens of equity seems to be the new buzzword. It's not just Prince William, it's nationwide. Everywhere I look, equity is in. M my concern is that how does, what is the outcome? Uh, so I asked Dr. Mr. Iman to, a couple of days ago, when we look at our equity report card, are we looking at outcomes for student learning? For example, the equity report card talks about student and staff demographics, assessment, college readiness, program participation and learning climate. You know, I've been around enough to know that um, you can go through all these workshops and nothing changes in terms of student learning. So is an outcome from all the training as we become more equity-minded, are you looking at a, some type of metric or rubric or an outcome that improves student, student learning? Yes, to your question. So um, the, the purpose of professional build development is to build an equity lens. Uh, 
The equity lens is then part of, is part one. So you then have to activate it, right? Into uh, metrics, accountability, and strategies. And so to be able to drive equity, you must understand it fundamentally. Examine, um, explore effective protocol, engaging learning about race and racism to support equity and inclusive learning environment. So as you apply it, there will be metric tools that are put in place. They're called equity impact tools. There will be ways in which we um, promote and continue to look at equity through the evaluative process, the continuum of the, uh, the strategic plan and what we call the um, continuous improvement. The continuous improvement right now is looking at what conversations we will have um, around the area of equity as we look at student populations, as we um, look at how we report data, how we discuss data. So the accountability isn't, oh, is, isn't just at the school level, it is how each department will function through that equity impact tool and lens. Every aspect of the division to include hiring practices, promotional practices, how we train leadership in the county, how we allocate our resources with an equity lens, um, how we look at distribution of funding with an equity lens. With each one of those, um, uh, what we call targets, there are tools, there are applications. So the first part, it's engendering awareness, building the cultural um, competency lens and understanding of the individual. The second part is putting it in place. And that is where continuous transformation, transparency, and accountability is essential. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, next, the update on the governor's school. Ms. Williams. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at the last Governor's School Board meeting, I believe um, we talked about uh, the fact that students remaining virtual for the remainder of the year. Uh, the budget and the calendar year were discussed. And we also began the process of um, being updated on early acceptance for our graduating seniors, um, the expansion of additional curriculum offerings next year and um, the math testing. So I'll have further updates as we move along in the year by our next meeting, but I will say that overall, um, our students' mental health was being monitored. We had additional services and one-on-ones being provided with our counselor at the governor's school. We have had success with our students having uh, being accepted for early admission and on scholarship. Um, I know that's important to Dr. Latifi always monitors that pretty heavily, um, but I will say that I am proud to sit on that board. I'm proud of all of the work that they do out there with all of our students um, and how mindful they are of not only the seniors who are graduating um, and their mental health and, and how that this pandemic and this year has affected them, but on top of that, the particular needs like students who are first in their families to go to college. Um, the, just, I mean, to talk a little bit about one of the things that the counselor out there is doing is she's instituting don virtual donut breaks. Um, so students have the opportunity to, to speak and, and just sort of socialize with each other virtually. There's mentoring going on with students um, from senior level to junior level. There's just so many things. Um, and again, I'd like to thank George Mason University for partnering with us and for agreeing to work with us on the expansion of course offerings next year. And we'll have more updates at the uh, next, after our next meeting. Thank you. Okay, next we'll go to board matters. Um, we'll start with Ms. Jessie. Uh, Dr. Latif, I did ask for a little bit more time, so I have something special tonight. Uh, tonight, uh, I would like to honor Women's History Month and the ending of Black History Month and our presentation on equity and access. So this presentation is it's not a long presentation, but there are two parts. Um, Ms. Denise McPhail, would you please Stand and come forth, please. My tribute is to this phenomenal woman 
and contributor to Prince William County community and our school community, Ms. Denise McPhail. Good evening. Uh, Mrs. McPhail, I'm sorry, but uh, there's another part to this. Okay. Thank you. I have had the pleasure of knowing Ms. Denise McPhail for quite some time. Uh, I got to know Denise because she re I received a letter from her and she asked for a hundred individuals to help her with the naming of Fanny Fitzgerald. Many people think that I had much to do with it, but it was Ms. Denise McPhail who had the idea. And as you might know, and I have this, I'm not sure the audience could see this, but Fanny Fitzgerald, Women of History, Fanny Fitzgerald was one of four women who desegregated Prince William County Public Schools. And those women were Fanny Fitzgerald, Zella Brown, Maxine Coleman, and Mary Porter. And Denise McPhail had that vision. So I got to know her that way. Then in 2008, Denise McPhail founded the Creative Performing Arts Center called KPAC. It is a performing arts center. She developed relationships and collaborated with very, various people in the county, including Colgan High School. The Courageous Four was a play that she produced at Colgan High School. They had a collaborative relationship there. And tonight I would like to, before you do your part, which is to honor a student. This is the culmination of her work tonight. She's going to honor a student and it is big, it's very big. But, but, Ms. McPhail, you know, as a principal, I always gave these teachers these cups for, I, I always said this cup is for you people who do things behind the scenes. So when we were talking today, you did not know that I planned to also honor you. Mm -hmm. So my husband, who was always with me, <laughs> this cup is for you, Thank to Denise you McPhail, for your work you. in the name of Fanny Fitzgerald, for Thank all your work with KPAC, the plays that you produce. And so this cup is for you. Thank you so much. And finally, I will say to you that I've seen many of your plays. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Nativity Scene, the, the Black Nativity, uh -huh. Courageous Four, and various plays. And tonight, I think you want to honor one of your students and mentor, mentees. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Jesse, and Mr. Jesse, for delivering. Um, good evening, Dr. Latif, school board members student school board member representatives. My name again is Denise McPhail. I reside in the Neapsco district and the amazing Joanne T. Hill resides in the Potomac district. While I wear many hats within this community, tonight I am speaking on behalf of KPAC as the co-founder and executive director. KPAC was established in Prince William County March 2002, incorporated February 2004. We developed a partnership with Colgan High School February 2016. Shortly thereafter is when we partnered with Colgan to produce the Courageous Four in regards to the four women who were instrumental in uh, integrating the Prince William County Public Schools. Uh, the, we call them the Courageous Four. KPAC became a founding resident arts partner at the Hilton Performing Arts Center, May 2010. KPAC is an acronym for the Creative and Performing Arts Center. And on behalf of KPAC, I wish to thank Mrs. Jesse for this opportunity, uh, uh, to, for this opportunity to recognize Mr. Jawan T. Hill. And I come before you tonight KPAC is a nonprofit organization. Uh, we exist to bridge art opportunity gaps for children, teens, and adults. 
Over the past 19 years, KPAC has transformed diverse lives through acting, singing, dancing, and creative writing workshops that culminate with a high quality performance. We illuminate African American life, history, culture, and that, that validates our shared humanity. Um, we're also thankful tonight to uh, Dr. Waltz, who has written many letters of support for our playbills over the years. Uh, but tonight, I've come to share good news with you, good news about the extraordinary accomplishments of Mr. Jawan T. Hill, who is with me this evening. Jawan joined KPAC at the tender age of nine uh, with a role in Amazing Grace, a play by Shea Youngblood, and the book by Mary Hoffman. We presented this play to the public April 2012 at the Hilton Performing Arts Center. Since that time, he has participated in several KPAC performances at the Hilton Performing Arts Center, Dancing in the Wings by the um, legendary Debbie Allen and the book by Miss Allen and Kadir Nelson, The Wiz, the play by Charlie Smalls, the book by William F. Brown, and KPAC's annual Christmas play, Black Nativity by Langston Hughes. In 2015, Jawan earned the lead role as Lonnie Collins in the play Locomotion by playwright Jacqueline Woodson. In 2019, Jawan served as the stage manager for KPAC's production of A Raisin in the Sun by Lorraine Hansberry. He was slated to direct August Wilson's play, uh, but COVID-19 had other plans. Uh, KPAC has cultivated Jawan over the years, but we're not alone. There is a village who has supported Jawan like his church, Star of Bethlehem Missionary Baptist Church, the Duke Ellington School of the Arts, Colgan High School, where he will graduate from in June, the Omega Psi Phi fraternity, the Pi Lambda Lambda chapter, and the entire Divine Nine, other churches and organizations who attended so many of our performances to see him on stage, and directors like Tyrell Lashley, who we got from Ellington and Disney, and Crystal Arful Adele, Katrina Stroman, and professor, professional actor doc, and director and playwright, excuse me, Albert Williams. We have all watched this young man, this triple threat, flourish to be extremely talented. This is why we have come to share with you that Jawan's dedication to the arts and his extraordinary work has been recognized beyond the local area. Jawan has been accepted to the Juilliard School Performing Arts Conservatory in New York, New York. Jawan was selected as one of 19 students from approximately 1,500 applicants worldwide. So I invite you tonight to join me to congratulate Mr. Jawan T. Hill on his fantastic accomplishments. And so I know he has some words that he would like to share as well. Good evening. I will not be long, I promise. <laughs> um, Dr. Latif, school board members, Dr. Waltz, and my fellow student school board members and representatives, I would like to thank Mrs. Jesse for affording me the opportunity to speak with you all tonight. My name is Jawan T. Hill. I'm a 17-year-old senior at Charles J. Colgan High School in the Center for Fine and Performing Arts, and I've just been accepted into my dream school, the Juilliard School of Drama in New York City, New York. I've been immersed in the arts since the age of nine when I joined, you know, the KPAC, uh, the Creative and Performing Arts Center, and KPAC has taught me a lot about the fundamentals of what theater is to the community and really what to the world is. Um, KPEC also introduced me to Duke Ellington School for the Arts, where I auditioned my eighth grade year and was accepted into the theater and vocal program. But I was faced with a choice, theater or vocal. And I did not know at that time that that choice would be the launch pad for what I would want to do for the rest of my life. At, I was uh, eventually accepted and um, thrived and had some of the best experiences of my life at the Duke Ellington School for the Arts, but I was faced with my first roadblock. I had to transition back from DC to school in Virginia, and it was devastating. But with luck, 
I landed at Charles J. Cogan High School when I auditioned for the theater program. I'm sorry. Um, in the theater program at both Ellington and Cogan, I performed in numerous productions on stage as well as behind the scenes, and I truly fell in love with the craft of acting. I've been blessed with the opportunity to study abroad at the British American Drama Academy, as well as accepted into the Summer Residential Governor's School for Virginia Arts Program for Theater. One of the most important things for me throughout my high school career was preparing for college. The moment that I heard about the Juilliard School, I knew that I would strive to attend to attend that school. I made a choice. If I'm going to dream, I might as well dream big. <laughs> and it's worked for me so far. Then came my second roadblock. In April 2020, my Mima was diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. My family immediately went to South Carolina to take care of her, and we did until her recent death on January 21st, 2021 just two weeks before my Juilliard callback audition. Her death has taken a, <clears throat> one moment. Her death has taken a huge toll on me and my family, but one thing I do know is that my Mima believed in me, and she claimed that I would be accepted. And I know that right now, she is smiling down on me saying my baby did it. My current goal is to attend Juilliard, but Juilliard is prestigious and expensive as well as, um, you know, so however, I have a village of supporters that want to see me be successful and attend Juilliard. I've applied for various scholarships and I'm uh, excited to reach my goal. The task before me seems impossible. However, I believed in myself to audition and God saw fit for me to allow me this opportunity. So I'm so appreciative to the teachers and staff at um, Colgan High School, at KPAC, the CFPA program, as well as Duke Ellington School for the Arts, the Omega U Mentoring Program, as well as my church family star Bethlehem. And I hope that I can continue to be a positive light in the Prince William County arts world for you. Thank you for your time. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. All right, Mr. Wilk. I'll just put my three minutes towards that presentation. I yield my time. Ms. Wall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to mention um, that on February 4th, um, the social media, um, uh, sorry, the Safe Schools Advisory Council sponsored a social media and internet safety webinar. Um, and it featured Mr. Billy Watts, the ITC at Colgan High School, and more than 150 participants um, across the division um, joined in with that webinar that consisted of parents, students, and employees. And um, the committee, or the council, sorry, the advisory council partnered with the police department and human trafficking experts for a Q&A afterwards. Um, and so in this online environment, um, we, we must be more aware and more vigilant. Uh, there's a greater need for understanding the threats that our kids face online, and this was a good start, um, and we hope to sponsor additional webinars. So I wanted to thank everybody involved in that, um, in pulling off that webinar. Um, also, this time, uh, the, over the last few weeks, I've been able to visit um, Battlefield High School, Reagan Middle School, um, Bull Run Middle School and Unity Braxton Middle School to welcome students to their first day of classes um, for all of our secondary returning students and to go around the school, see how things are going, um, talk with students and staff, um, and it's just been a really great experience to understand greater, uh, have a greater understanding of what's going on in the schools in the Gainesville District. Um, today I was able to go into Battlefield High School and assist with their lunch. Um, uh, with the cafeteria folks in the lunch, and that was just really great fun. Uh, great fun, as besides welcoming kids at seven o'clock in the morning, that was also great fun. Um, I was able to visit with the Battlefield representative Abdullah Yusuf Sai from Battlefield, and he gave me some great feedback from the student perspective and the family perspective. And I really appreciate the work that he is doing to try to connect with um, additional folks in the Gainesville district for me and for the student senate. Um, I also had the opportunity to go to uh, the opening football game at Battlefield High School because I have a daughter in the band, and so therefore I could be a legitimate spectator. Um, and even though it was, it started to snow halfway through the event, it was really exciting. Um, Battlefield was victorious, 17-7 over John Champ, our, one of our Loudoun County rivals. I'm hoping um, to be able to attend more events like this in the future because of our um, 
increase in the number of spectators. Uh, obviously, as a parent, I was able to get into that event, but it's very difficult still to get into some of the events. But I really do commend all the, the activities that are starting and the cooperation of our athletes and students um, as they cooperate with the rules and they, that they are patient with the things that they're asked to do. Um, I appreciate so very much um, teachers and staff and students and families for their patience and their hard work in um, making all of the division's goals um, come to pass. And I really would just want to say, um, you know, thank you to everybody for all their hard work. Thank you, Ms. Wall. Ms. Woy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just like to start off by saying happy uh, Women's History Month as we um, and Black History Month, the shortest month of the year. I think it's important that we um, take, turn our attention to Women's History Month, but in the framework of equity that we remember um, these all year long because they are important to all of us in one way or the other. Um, I also want to bring attention to, I think it's Read Across America Week, if I'm saying it correctly. Um, all of our schools, I know, are doing something in celebration. I will be honored again to read virtually at one of my elementary schools, and I'm still very excited about that. Um, I know that some of the schools are also participating each night and having different teachers read to students virtually on Zoom, which is exciting. We have definitely been doing that in my house, and I have seen my student um, my child's love of learning increased just from seeing a different variety of teachers read. And um, actually, his principal read on the very first night. We missed it, but I heard about it. So I had I got it. Oh, ma. So I, I just um, can't emphasize how important reading is for all of us at ev all stages of our lives. And I just, I love, I love Read Across America Week. Um, also want to update folks and remind them that the next meeting for the Racial and Social Justice Committee will be on March 18th at 6.30 p.m. Um, we also next week have an upcoming budget final work session. And over the next two weeks, the county will also be addressing their budget. And I think that when we talk about priorities and what we care about and what's important, budget is just another way of saying our priorities. So I would encourage members of the public to get involved and stay involved. Um, as we have your intention now from all of our Return to Learn meetings, um, let us not lose your intention as we go, your attention as we go into budget season. And I just want to thank Ms. Jessie um, and Ms. Denise McPhail for your presentation tonight. Um, and thank you again for bringing your student and recognizing it. Remind me your last name again. It just left. Hill. Hill. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Um, I just think it's important um, that we are able to highlight you because so often we talk about the students who go off into Yale and we talk about students who go into trades and we don't often talk about the arts. And I know all of us up here have a deep love for the arts in one way or the other. Um, and I just think it is fantastic that you're coming from our school division. You spoke to us tonight. You, you put a physical face, something that other students can see um, that is a reality, that you a dream that you've made a reality. And I wish you all the best, success in the future. And um, you know, when we look at Spark and other nonprofit organizations that donate to students for scholarships, I hope that this is another reminder that the arts need donations and scholarships too. Thank you for um, being willing to come up here and speak. I know it's nerve wracking, but you did a fantastic job. Ms. Jackson. Thank you. Um, I wanted to send a continued thank you to Prince William County staff, especially those who've been in the building since last March. This week, Ms. Wall and I held a working group to discuss the budget um, as that we can't meet for office hours due to COVID. Please email me with any questions on the budget. I've enjoyed watching the many different schools in my district celebrate Black History Month, and I also want to extend my sincere gratitude to Dr. Nichols and the staff at Unity Read for hosting the vaccination clinics, and of course to the pandemic team for everything they do and to Novant. Tonight, I really appreciated the candor with which the principal spoke, and I look forward to further dialogue as we continue to phase in students, or as we continue the transition after phasing in students. Thank you to staff for helping um, making, to make this meeting accessible for me. Um, as I've mentioned before, it's difficult for me to navigate um, this mass world, and I really appreciate the, um, the, the help and um, the grace and understanding during this time. And congratulations. 
Um, please continue to prioritize student and staff safety by following CDC guidelines and um, after schools as well. And what we do as a community directly impacts our schools. Um, I want to offer my sincere condolences to um, the Woodbridge Middle School community and the family of Ms. Cervantes. She was an amazing and kind person who went out of her way to show love and grace to all students. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Ms. Ralston. Um, thank you. Good night. Ms. Zargapur. Thank you, Dr. Latif. I will keep this short because I am COVID, COVID weary, COVID tired. I know our teachers and our staff are too. So as we are moving through the rest of the school year, please um, extend kindness to one another. Be mindful of how um, everyone's uh, situation is, is unique to themselves, how they're feeling, what they're going through. Uh, thank you to all the students who've reached out this week with your various um, uh, excitement about going back into the building for some of you. Some of you have reached out with concerns about what it's like to be a virtual student and some ideas that you have for change. Um, I want to also remind people that, um, well, I think it's been mentioned here, we have had staff who've been working through this pandemic since uh, schools closed in March last year. And we don't want to lose sight of the fact that we've had food service, we've had people working in the buildings, we've had administrators who have had to reconfigure everything from top to bottom, we've had special ed teachers in since day one, we added our kindergarten, our um, first, second, third, and now we've got more students in, and now we need to be thinking about what we can do better and make this even better as we move through the year. Uh, last thing I'll say is make sure you wear your mask, wash your hands, keep your distances, and please, if you are not feeling well, stay home. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. All right, Ms. Zaripour, we cannot have a meeting without that. It is so critical that our vice chair remind everyone how important it is to mask, wash your hands, keep your distance, stay home if you're sick. Since she has been doing that, we have now reached 7.89 on the seven-day CDC metrics. Technically, I think in the orange or the yellow now in their new color coding that they so desired, but we're getting there, we're getting there, and thank you very much. Our metrics are improving, our vaccination numbers are continuing to go up. All good news, lots of good news over the weekend from folks whose students have attended in person. A lot of great pictures, a lot of great stories, a lot of great teachers and principals reaching out saying how happy they are to be back. A lot of students thrilled to be back and that is just the fantastic news over the last week and we are thrilled for them. I wanna thank, um, you know, I mentioned Denise Hebner and the pandemic team, and we've heard a lot about the efforts they did, and, and Dr. Nichols here this evening. Um, there were parent volunteers. I see one here in the room. I don't wanna embarrass her, but I will. Rana Call has been at all the clinics, or as many of them as at least I have, and she's been there volunteering, making sure folks are fed, and, and has brought food, picked up coffee and donuts, and her and her family have done a terrific job. Her two children have started school at Benton and Colgan have sent nice letters to the board. And so we're excited to um, move the division forward um, to in-person learning. Today is the last first day, as everyone recalls. Um, I guess, am I out of time, Jason? I don't know. I don't know if the timer went on. But anyways, thank you all. It was a, um, another long meeting, but we hope to, um, um, I think our next meeting, we'll all see you all as a work session next Wednesday for the budget. So have a great night, everyone. Meeting adjourned.